Hello friends. This is God of Fiction. How are you all? So in this video, we will see. What if Naruto had power of white dragon and fell in love with Tsubaki Shinra? But before we start, if you want more amazing stuff like this, then be sure to subscribe to our channel and like this video. Also if possible share this video with your friends. Now without wasting any more time, let's begin the story. Naruto Uzumaki the last of his clan and current wielder of the mid-tier Longinus Divine Dividing. At a young age, Naruto had his most precious people taken from him, both his parents Minato and Kashina Uzumaki Namikaze died giving their lives for him. Having spent five wonderful years with them, Naruto could not have been happier in his short time in the world but all good things came to an end, his went down in flames. A fire consumed his home, his parents were unable to do anything but save him unable to save themselves before the fire consumed their home. Naruto was young and details of that night were burned into his mind and he could not forget a single detail. How could he, that was the day he had lost everything that he deemed precious. On that day, Naruto found feathers of black raining from the skies, he did not know what they were but he would later on. At the age of five, he was later on taken away by the authorities and sent to an orphanage where he resided for an entire year. Then someone came for him, a man by the name of Dulio Gaswaldo. Dulio was a young man with blonde hair, green eyes, and was dressed in priest clothes, he had been traveling around Japan for some tasty cuisines that he had not tasted and found a powerful source of magic in this area. Imagine his surprise when he found a young boy too small for his age with such a powerful source of magic residing in his body. Dulio then proceeded to adopt him, there no doubt about it, this was the son of Minato Namikaze and Kashina Yuzwamki. Though Dulio knew that Minato and Kashina would not have wanted him to get involved with the supernatural world so that was why they had plans for him in the orphanage rather than the church. Even if it was against their decisions and wishes, Dulio knew that Naruto would be later bothered by one of the other two fashions later on and it was his duty to help his fallen friend's child. Minato was known as the Yellow Flash, a moniker given to him due to his amazing speeds with his technique the Flying Thunder God. Flying Thunder God or Hiraishin utilized the Uzumaki clan's amazing sealing magic allowing him to pass through space and time traveling to areas where he marked with his seal. Such a technique took quite a lot out of him the first time he used it, but he had over time mastered it to a degree where he could easily wipe out massive groups of enemy soldiers. Kashina was known for a similar thing, having contracted a fox at a young age she was able to fight alongside it. But it was not just any fox either, it was a Kyubi. A fox with nine tails were rare among Yukai with its power rivaling ultimate class devils, not only did she have power of such a beast, but she also was very skilled in sealing as well. Both were known seal masters, sealing was such a rare skill that many factions and supernatural groups feared them for their powers with simple ink and paper. And with such fear, they were marked as enemies of many supernatural groups and if Naruto was known to the world he would be hunted down. Naruto was unknown to the church as he spent his time traveling with Dulio. They spent a majority of his childhood traveling around the world tasting fine cuisine from all cultures. Once Naruto was old enough, Dulio decided it was time for him to learn of supernatural beings. Naruto for one did not believe him until he was shown literal proof, Dulio did just that, showing off the power of his sacred gear, Zenith Tempest. It was amusing to see Naruto so odd from the power he had displayed, but it was on that day that Dulio had learned of Naruto's sacred gear. A trip to England had ended differently than he had hoped, on their trip a band of devils had attacked them thinking them as enemies and Dulio had been occupied with a few devils one had engaged Naruto who was not even adept in the arts of magic. In a desperate attempt to escape, Naruto had called forth the power hidden inside his body the power of a dragon, not just any dragon but the white dragon emperor himself, Albion. Dulio had swore to Minato and Kashina that day to train Naruto to the best of his abilities so he was ready for what the supernatural world had to offer. Naruto was a quick learner, that phrase did not do him any justice as Naruto learned whatever he threw at him with such vigor and eagerness that Dulio had to double his training. No Naruto stood at the age of 17 above average height and looking more and more like his father every day, though appearances belonged to his father Naruto still held that fiery temper from his mother. Dulio had managed to quell his fiery temper to a certain degree, but Naruto would still lose control when he felt the ones precious to him threatened. His personality was another one. Being around Dulio for a majority of his short life he had developed a laid-back personality. Having possession of divine dividing, Dulio knew that it was a matter of time before he church found out about him. Even with all his power and influence as the most powerful exorcist, 
he could not keep them away from Naruto for very long. Even if he did not wish for Naruto to be caught up in it, there was no choice but to do whatever he could to help him now. Naruto had pieced everything together when Dulio had told him about the supernatural world, those black feathers that resembled crow feathers belonged to only a single faction, the fallen angels. That had ignited a fire in his heart, the desire to find whoever had killed his parents and find answers of his own, it was better than having others tell him their very own answers. Albion, the vanishing dragon residing in his sacred gear was intrigued about his new possessor. Being different from others, the young Yuzwamki held something that some of his past possessors did not have, the potential to become one of the greatest. Having Yuzwamki blood flowing in his veins and magic power that dwarfed many, Albion could not have asked for a better possessor once he met with his rival he would win the battle. There was little doubt in Albion's mind that Naruto would and could become the most powerful white dragon emperor from past, present, and future. The meeting between host and dragon was a bit strange, Naruto had appeared in a throne room with white columns leading toward a pure white throne. Having no idea why he was here, Naruto felt compelled to take a seat upon the throne and that was what he had done. The cold surface sent shivers up his back, but power also coursed through his entire being, filling him with overwhelming power that seemed unreal for anyone to possess. A bright blue sphere appeared before him, a shower of blue particles fell from the sphere, Naruto reached out and grabbed hold of it and that was when he and Albion had met for the first time. The two had a strange relationship that later on evolved into a partnership between dragon and human. It was odd how powerful the duo could become once they had worked out a partnership together, Naruto was able to unlock the forbidden stage of his sacred gear at a young age. Unlocking the armor of the white dragon emperor, Naruto achieved balance breaker for the first time during his training sessions with Dulio. Such a feat was astounding for him, after all he was 12 for crying out loud able to access balance breaker was amazing for anyone but a 12-year-old could do it was just amazing. Albion was very pleased to see his host achieving such feats at such a young age, his host was truly powerful for his age. Albion couldn't wait until they met the Red One and finally battled it out, with a host like Naruto they could not lose. Later on, Naruto would meet Michael when he was 15 of age. The Archangel was shocked that Dulio had kept such a secret from him, going against Minato and Kashina's wishes did not sit well with him. Final wishes of two of his most powerful and loyal members of church he had wished were followed through, but Dulio did have a logical argument as Naruto would be in danger if he was ignorant. It was truly complicated situation in which what Minato and Kashina had set up for Naruto would contradict with what they desired for their child. Michael would soon steal his resolve and accept Naruto into the church as an exorcist, though he did not wish to go against Minato and Kashina's wishes for their child, he would have been in danger if he did not. Naruto, get the door. Dulio called out as he returned his attention back to his meal. Hearing a grumble from the other room, Naruto entered the dining room with a priest following him from behind. Can't you come back when I'm done with my food? Naruto had grown taller since his years with Dulio, standing above average height for his age Naruto had kept his spiky blonde hair similar to his father's but had cut off his side bangs. His blue eyes shone with boredom as he crossed his arms and waited. Naruto's outfit consisted of an orange t-shirt with loose black pants and a jacket over his shirt, orange being his favorite color was always present in his outfit, though at times he was forced into those annoying church clothing. I am sorry Dulio sama but Mihal sama has requested you and Naruto-san to meet him immediately. The priest responded with a bow of his head, a groan escaped Dulio's mouth as he nodded in acknowledgement and placed his chopsticks down and walked out of the house with Naruto trailed behind him. Naruto-kun Dulio kun it is great to see you again. Michael greeted with the usual kind smile on his face. Looking at them he decided it was best to tell them of the situation first. Naruto kun, I am sending you on a mission to Kuo Town, Japan. Seeing the curious expression on his face Michael decided to elaborate, there is a slight problem there you see. Kokabil from the fallen faction has decided it was necessary for more war, so it is best to send you to stop him before war actually comes. Dulio kun. I cannot send you if I do it would cause more harm to the situation rather than help. Two of our young swordsmen are there collecting the missing Excalibur pieces and I fear they are in danger. Also if you could Naruto-kun, please stop Kokabil before he spreads some classified information. I understand Michael-sama, I shall leave immediately. Nartuo replied as he got up and walked out of the church, once he was outside, a pair of white dragon wings appeared on his back as he took off into the skies, flying towards Japan. Albion. What do you think about our assignment? This could be interesting. Albion responded as his wings shone brighter as his partner spoke to him. 
Naruto smiled at that as he continued towards Japan. Albion was a good partner and he could not have asked for a better dragon residing in his sacred gear. Naruto do you sense that? Yeah. Naruto replied his eyebrows raised as his head stayed looking in Japan's general direction and a larger smile formed on his face. Though the energy signature was weak, Naruto was certain it was Diedrig and the boosted gear. Looks like we finally found the red one, E.H. Albion? Ha 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 ha. Finally the red one has been found partner. Albion responded in a joy-filled tone. His host is weak, such a weak signature is nothing compared to yours partner. The only reason we found his energy source was due to erected dome, without it we could not have found him, such a weak energy signature we could have easily passed by without knowing it was him. I think you got a little arrogant, partner. Naruto commented as he returned his attention to flying. Besides, being weak isn't such a bad thing. How could I not partner? Albion questioned with an amused tone. With you as my partner we could surpass all and become the greatest white dragon emperor to ever grace the earth. Releasing a sigh, Naruto kept flying but he could not help but smile at Albion's words of praise, though it seemed like the vanishing dragon was ignoring his other statement. Over the years, Albion and him had developed a relationship built solely on trust. Naruto had allowed Albion to control his body when he it was needed and allowed him to control the flow of power he would received from the dragon. Albion in return was always giving him power that was needed and worked with him as an equal. Dragons were prideful creatures that did not bow to anything lower than their existence, but Albion had acknowledged Naruto and thus they were equals in their partnership. It was shocking how much Albion enjoyed such a partnership, it seemed as if Naruto was a few of the humans that received his respect as well. Rias Grammary held the appearance of a beautiful young woman in her late teens with white skin, blue eyes and a buxom figure. Her most distinctive feature was her long beautiful crimson hair that reached down to her thighs, with a single strand of hair standing up and also her hair had loose bangs covering her forehead and side bangs framing her face. Being a Grammary, she had not been exposed to many situations in which she felt actual fear, but here she was with her peerage helpless before one of the leaders of Grigori. Her peerage consisted of many members, there was Akano her queen, Yudo her knight, Kaniko her rook, and Issei her pawn. Akano was a beautiful young woman with a voluptuous figure around the same age as Rias with very long black hair and violet eyes. Her black hair was usually tied in a long ponytail, which reached down to her legs with two strands sticking out from the top and sloping backwards, with an orange ribbon keeping it in place, she had on a shrine maiden's outfit. Yudo held the appearance of handsome young man with short blonde hair, gray eyes, and a mole under his left eye, he was wearing the Kuo Academy uniform without the blazer. Kaneko held an appearance of a petite girl with white hair and hazel eyes, the front of her hair had two long bangs going past her shoulders and several loose bangs hanging over her forehead, while her back has a short bob cut, she too was wearing the female Kuo Academy uniform. Issei the final and newest member of Rias's peerage stood at average height with short brown hair and light brown eyes, he liked Kiba wore the school uniform but he had on the blazer. There were others fighting against Kokebiel as well, Xenovia Quarta a young woman with chin-length blue hair with a green fringe on the right side and dark yellow eyes. She wore her church battle outfit, which consisted out black skin tight short-sleeved unitard with pauldrons, matching her finger-less gloves and thigh-high leather boots. Dressed similarly was her partner Irina. Irina was a beautiful young woman with long chestnut hair and violet eyes. Her hair was tied back into twin tails. Their opponent was Kokebiel himself, a leader of Grigori. Kokebiel held the appearance of a young man with black hair, unlike other fallen angels, he had pointy ears. Dressed in a black robe with accessories, it allowed his five pair of wings to be shown freely. Kokebiel was amused by those pitiful worms that were trying to oppose him, it was very amusing indeed. His plan was so close to success, all he had to do now was kill the pathetic worms standing before him now and he could have another war. In the previous war, they could have won if it was not Azazel's intervention but now he could start another one in which the fallen angels would win against both angel and devil. From here on out, I will start a war, I will take your heads as a gift, even if it's only me, I will continue from where we left off, I'm going to show Sirzex and Michael that we, the fallen angels, are the ultimate beings. Kokebiel shouted in glee as an insane fit of laughter escaped his lips. Everyone present just looked at him in horror, their loves were going to end here, and a war was going to break out because of the insane fallen angel. War, finally we can have war once more. Raising his arms above his head, Kokebiel formed a massive spear of light that dwarfed his entire figure and in comparison he was an ant. 
Looks of horror all formed on everyone's face as they could only stare at the massive spear pointing towards them. Death was what waited for them, it was hopeless now to fight against something so massive in size, that it could easily vaporize them by touch. Before Kokabiel could even launch a spear, the dome that was erected around them keeping Kokabiel from destroying Japan was shattered and a figure shrouded in white light descended onto the ground. It can't be. Diedrich shouted in shock. What is it Diedrich? Issei asked as he looked at his sacred gear in confusion, is it that guy over there? Be careful around him Issei, that is the host of my rival and he will be your rival to come. Diedirade answered, it seems that the white one's host is stronger than what I imagined him to be. Who the hell are you? Kokabiel shouted his question at Naruto who had stowed away his sacred gear and the light that once surrounded him died down and he stood there in his regular attire. I am Naruto Uzumaki. Naruto responded as he looked at Kokabiel with a calculative look on his face. Uzumaki, isn't that the name of that family I had killed? Kokabiel asked in a mocking tone. A sneer was on his face as a laugh escaped his lips. That look on their faces when they tried to escape with their baby. Ha ha ha. Too bad Michael didn't declare war when that happened, but it wasn't a waste of time. I got to see those pathetic humans desperately try to save themselves. Ha ha ha. Those feathers. Naruto murmured as his eyes widened in shock before they shifted into ones of rage. His pupils shrunk as his eyes took on a fierce look, similar to one of a dragon's. A pair of white dragon wings shot from his back and a death glare was sent at Kokabiel. Those hideous feathers were yours. Ha ha ha. You finally figured it out. Kokabiel gave another fit of maniacal laughter. Finally I can kill you and complete my list of Uzumakis. I'll make you pay. Naruto shouted in rage as his wings shone with power and he flew into the air. Kokabiel didn't have a chance to throw his spear as a fist connected with his jaw and sent him flying away. Divide. Draining power from his spear, Naruto felt his power rise to new levels as he directed his gaze at Kokabiel who had recovered from his punch and was glaring at Naruto with hate-filled eyes. How dare you hit you? You filthy human. Kokabiel shouted in rage as he flew towards Naruto and a sword made of light appeared in his hands. Naruto didn't even bat an eyelash as he encased his arm in wind magic and grabbed hold of Kokabiel's blade. I am going to clip your filthy wings you crow. Naruto yelled as he added more force to his grip on the light sword and shattered it into tiny particles of light before sending a punch at Kokabiel's stomach. Not relenting, Naruto formed a Rasengan in his other hand and slammed it on Kokabiel's back, the result of his actions sent Kokabiel plummeting down towards the ground. Before Kokabiel could reach the ground, Naruto rushed down towards him, but before he could reach him Kokabiel recovered enough to send a barrage of light spears towards him. Weaving through the spears, Naruto was forced back as more and more shot towards him. Kokabiel proceeded to create a larger and more destructive spear as he shot it towards Naruto who had finished dodging the spears and turned to face another one flying towards him. Raising his hand, Naruto split the beam in half as he drained the energy from the attack and filled up his barely used reserves. His previous uses of magic barely used any of his magical power thus excess magic filled his system. Albion, expel the extra magic. You got it partner. Albion responded as the divine dividing shone brighter and blue magic particles were released from his wings and they fluttered in the air around Naruto. Oh ho, it seems like you found the one with those filthy wings, partner. Why don't we show them the power of supremacy? Let us them, Albion. Naruto said as he crossed his arms and he was consumed by a bright white light, vanishing dragon balance breaker. Partner, finish this crow and show him what true power is. Albion said with a glee-filled tone as Naruto nodded his head in acknowledgement and began the change into his armor. Once the light died down, Naruto had white dragon armor formed around him with blue jewels decorating it. In this form, it boosted his speed, power, durability, and allowed him to use his power of divide without the 10 second limit, though temporarily it was still a very useful ability that it granted him. Looking at Kokabiel through his helmet, Naruto channeled all the rage and frustration that he had felt towards his family's demise and charged forward, his goal was Kokabiel's head. Kokabiel was not the only one shocked by Naruto's new form, Issei and the others were as well. To see a completed balance breaker was shocking enough as it was the forbidden stage that all sacred gears possessed, but to seeing it used was not as shocking but the power that was emitted during the transformation was what brought out their shock. Issei was most shocked out of them all. His destined rival was able to achieve something that he could not even muster at his condition now, what else was Naruto Uzumaki capable of? Prepare yourself Kokabiel. Naruto responded as he rushed forward, 
but Kokabiel had already planned a way of attack as another barrage of light spears flew towards him. Vanishing from the position he was once situated, Naruto appeared before Kokabiel with a raised fist and slammed it against his face. Following up his former attack, Naruto punched Kokabiel once more with his other fist. Kokabiel retaliated with a punch of his own, but Naruto caught it before it could reach his face and began crushing his hand. Screaming in pain, Kokabiel formed a light sword in his free hand and sent it towards Naruto, who caught it with his other hand. Adding pressure to both hands, Naruto heard the familiar sounds of bones being crushed as Kokabiel's screams got louder and his blade shattered into tiny shards of light based magic. Clenching his fist, Naruto punched Kokabiel back once more, this time Kokabiel was prepared for this as he drew a blade and went to stab him. Releasing his hold of Kokabiel, Naruto leaned back and allowed the blade to come forward, luckily enough he was able to dodge fast enough for the blade to reach its limited range and stop a little ways before reaching him. But that did not stop Kokabiel as a kick was planted against his chest and Naruto was pushed backwards for a good distance before he recovered and charged at Kokabiel. Like his previous attempts to charge him head first, he was met with another barrage of light spears. This time Naruto did not bother to dodge them as he took the attacks head on, but they did not even touch him as multiple magic circles appeared where the light spears were supposed to hit. Using the magic he was collecting from the light spears, Naruto compressed the collected magic into a wave of lightning that shot out from his body and moved towards Kokabiel who was busy preparing another massive spear of light. This time he succeeded in its creation and use as Kokabiel threw it straight at Naruto who raised his hand, divide. The familiar sensation of his magic coursing through his entire body was felt once again as Naruto raised his hand and a basketball sized sphere of blue magic formed in his palm and soon wind began swirling around it and the sphere turned into a large Fuma shuriken with the, the sphere in the middle. This was his Rosen shuriken. A buzzing sound was emitting from his technique. Throwing the deadly technique forward, it flew straight for Kokabil. Kokabil merely leaned to the right avoiding Naruto's Rosen Shuriken, but he did not expect it to expand and a massive dome of wind blades consumed him entirely. The only two ways for Naruto to use his Rosen Shuriken was through Senjutsu and when he donned his scale mail. Having some sort of protection against the blades of wind that formed around the Rasengan, allowed him to use that technique to its fullest. If he had used it without Senjutsu or his scale mail, his hand would have been easily gone from his body as the wind blades were too close and could easily damage him. Such an attack was powerful, it damaged people caught in its radius was at a cellular level, easily damaging nerves and possibly the ones caught in its range's ability to use magic. Once Kokabiel was seen again, his dome of wind blades had vanished leaving behind a heavily damaged Kokabiel. Though Kokabiel could barely keep himself in the air, he was not willing to let the blonde win, he needed this war to prove his dominance. Panting heavily, Kokabiel could not even retaliate when Naruto appeared behind him and grabbed hold of his wings. Looking at Naruto in shock and fear, Kokabil did not have time to do anything as both his wings were ripped from his back and his feathers scattered into the wind. Kokabil screamed in pain as he was dropped from the sky and plummeted towards the earth, without his wings falling from such a height would ensure death especially being damaged by Naruto like that. Kokabil was caught just before he touched the ground and Naruto simply shouldered Kokabil's heavily damaged body and prepared to fly off. Are you going to ignore me, white one? Diedrich asked from Issei's boosted Heia. Naruto turned to face him and Albion decided to respond, of course not red one, but it is not time for our battle yet. Your host is too weak at the moment and I don't think my host would like to fight someone so weak. No other words were exchanged as Naruto took off into the air with Kokabil in hand, leaving behind a group of shocked and confused devils. That technique of yours sure packs and punch. Dulio commented as he whistled in awe as he saw the battered Kokabil. Those little wind blades are quite nasty, aren't they? It was the perfect place to test the Rosen Shuriken. Naruto replied as he released a sigh of relief. Having made it back to church with Kokabil, Naruto was now relaxing at home with Dulio there snacking as usual. And I did not expect it to do so much damage, now that it's completed, I have another attack added to my arsenal. Don't you think that's a bit of an overkill? Dulio asked as he munched on a meat bun. Besides, your divine dividing is already dangerous enough. What is the point of making another technique that you would hardly use? Dulio Ni San, you are the one to teach me that our sacred gears are tools and not to rely on them too much. Naruto responded with a wave of his hand, taking a drink of the juice Dulio had offered him earlier. Dulio was silent for some time before asking in a serious tone, Did you do that to Kokabil because of what he did to your parents? How did you? That's not important at the moment, Naruto, 
did you or did you not? No, but I do admit I nearly lost control of myself. Naruto finally replied as he released another sigh. If I really did want to make Kokebeel suffer, I would have unleashed Juggernaut Drive. The Rosin Shuriken was merely for a test of its true power, to make him suffer for what he did I would have used the true power of Albion, the true power of the White Dragon Emperor. The boosted gear and the divine dividing were complete opposites, by power and dragon alike. The boosted gear multiplied the user's power and gave it away, the divine dividing split the enemy's power and gave it to the user. Their dragon spirits residing in each sacred gear were no exception either, Diedrig the Welsh dragon and Albion the vanishing dragon. Both dragon emperors in their own right with opposite sets of abilities that fought for dominance over the other, it seemed what they said about opposites was true, they did attract but not in the way people thought. For centuries both dragons fought, through their hosts they continued their battle, supremacy versus domination, an endless battle that stretched since the dawn of time itself. Partner, you such a stage is impossible to maintain without proper control of the energy flow that is sent into your body. Albion said as he reprimed his partner for his stubbornness. Adding another source of energy into your system while in scale mail could easily kill you, if you were a normal human like that Hyodo then your body would have burned out from all that magical power already. I know Albion, but if I can get it to work then our power could increase by dramatic levels. Naruto responded as he panted softly, his body was tired from his constant training sessions, though tired and his body hurt Naruto pushed on and willed himself to continue. Besides, we trained harder than this before and my body has been in worse condition. Nothing one night's sleep can't fix. That stubbornness is going to be the end of you, Naruto. Albion replied with a sigh. Then again, this power will help us beat Diedrich all that faster, so let's do this thing partner. What's a damaged body compared to beating Diedrich in our final battle? I am glad you have your priorities straight, Albion. Naruto said in a dry tone, his face matched his tone quite well. Nerut released a sigh and began channeling his magic around him once more. Determination had not wavered and Naruto prepared once more, this time we won't fail. Well we failed. Naruto said in a cheerful tone as his wounds suffered from his previous training session were being bandaged by Dulio. Though his wounds were so severe that they seemed unlikely to be caused from a mere training session, Naruto had been through worse and all it took was a few days of rest and his body would have healed and then his training could continue. You know, for some combat genius you seem to get hurt more than others during training. Dulio spoke up suddenly, seeing the annoyed expression that Naruto sent him Dulio decided to continue, Michael Sama said to meet him in the church when your training session was over. Hi. Naruto replied as he sat up from his seated position on the couch and winced slightly as pain erupted from his bandaged wounds. Do you know why Michael Sama wanted to see me for? Dulio shook his head in response as Nartuo nodded in acceptance and walked out of their home without another word. Whistling a cheerful tune, Naruto made his way into the church after a short walk from where he and Dulio resided. Once he entered the church Naruto spotted Michael standing there with his usual smile plastered on the archangel's face. Naruto-kun, it is great to see you again, Michael said with his usual smile beaming towards Naruto. I am glad you had taken care of Kokebeel before he could have started a war between the three factions. You did well. Thank you Michael-sama. Naruto replied with a smile of his own. Though he wished he had beaten Kokebeel faster it was no issue as he had done what had been ordered of him. But I fear Kokebeel was able to speak of our lord's fate before you could reach Kuo on time. Michael said as his smile dropped a little before he turned to face Naruto who seemed to have been shocked slightly by the news he had just delivered. Do not worry Naruto-kun, it was not your fault, we were a good distance away from Japan and you could not reach there in time. Naruto accepted the answer as he gave Michael his attention once more. Michael seeing that took it as a sign to continue. But that is not the reason I have brought you here. The reason I have brought you here has to do with your encounter with the Red Dragon Emperor. I have feared this time would come when you would meet him. Now that you have, your final battle against the Red Dragon Emperor has been confirmed. This is my question to you, Naruto-kun, do you wish to fight the Red Dragon Emperor? Thinking about the question for a second, Naruto truly had to ask himself if he really did desire to fight the Red Dragon Emperor. This battle between dragons was fought many times before yet came to no decisive conclusion. All Naruto wanted to do was get stronger, with strength he could protect the ones precious to him so fighting a dragon equal to his very own partner would likely help in his path, so his answer was yes. Opening his mouth, Naruto spoke in a confident tone, Michael-sama, the answer to your question is yes. Do explain Naruto-kun, Michael replied with a curious tone, 
To protect my precious people I will get stronger. Naruto said his tone still held that confidence from before. And to get stronger I will defeat the Welsh dragon. I feared you would say that. Michael sighed but his smile seemed to brighten, his hands shone with a golden light and soon a blade manifested before him. It was beautiful golden blade with a guard resembling a dragon's claw, grabbing hold of the blade Michael laid it out before him and offered it to Naruto. This is Ascalon, a holy sword wielded by Saint Peter himself, a blade known for its dragon slaying capabilities. Though we do not wish for you to fight against the Red Dragon Emperor, I cannot stop you either. This predestined battle shall happen eventually and since I cannot stop you so I shall help you instead. Naruto was beyond shocked, his eyes were the size of dinner plates. How could he not be shocked, the church was granting him one of the most prized and well guarded weapons in their arsenal. Michael Sama, thank you. Taking hold of Ascalon, Naruto began testing the blade's balance in his hand, finding it perfect he bowed his head in gratitude and Naruto couldn't help but smile. Michael watched this scene play out and his smile widened, though it was true heaven did not wish for further conflict but for Naruto he would be an exception, it was true that they had truly desired to help Naruto against the red dragon emperor, but Ascalon needed to be wielded and seeing that one of their own holy sword users knew the truth about their lord's fate they needed to boost their strength to maintain a balance between factions. 1. Albion, what can we do about the blade? Naruto asked as now sat in the training grounds with Ascalon in his hands. Such a powerful weapon, now we have a way to slay other dragons. Albion commented as he thought about his partner's question. Naruto waited patiently for his dragon to answer his question. Though we are able to add it into the divine dividing, I do not think it would be any help to have the blade stuck inside the divine dividing. Naruto I recommend training with that holy sword until we strengthen your body to handle the extra strain the blade will add when combining its dragon slaying capabilities into our attacks. 2. Naruto nodded as Ascalon vanished from his hands in a shower of white light, leaning against a tree Naruto spoke, Albion, how much power can extra power can I contain without it straining my body? Currently, your body is above a normal humans and your magic reserves are massive dwarfing even ultimate class devils. I would have to say 10 times your normal amount taking in consideration your Uzumaki body. Albion replied. With Ascalon in our arsenal, we can double our energy intake and use the blade as a medium for excess magic power. That would increase our performance and power output in battle by a dramatic degree, but I would need help training with Ascalon. Naruto mused, though he was not a regular genius, he was a genius in combat. Having the mental fortitude to think of plans on the spot, though he did not seem to apply into academics. Besides, Ascalon is a holy sword, the power we can store in that blade would be very useful in the future. How come you never used those words before? Albion questioned, knowing that it would annoy Naruto. Then again, you know what humans say, there's a first time for everything. You picking a fight, you old bag of scales? Naruto responded instantly, his eyebrows twitched in annoyance. What are you going to do about it, you blonde idiot? Albion questioned, mirth clearly audible in his voice. I can't believe that Michael was dumb enough to appoint you the general of the fourth pillar. I'm gonna use Ascalon on you, you old bag of scales. Naruto said his annoyance seemed to have risen to new levels. How are you gonna reach me, I'm just a spirit. Albion said in a mocking tone, first time glad of his lack of a physical body. An old bag of scales? You need more insults. You're impossible. Naruto shouted annoyed with this situation entirely. He couldn't just walk away Albion was literally in him so he could do nothing to avoid the annoying dragon. Twilight healing, a rare sacred gear with only a few wielders of such a useful tool, having the ability to heal all devils, angels, humans, and fallen angels alike it was very sought after. Having been manifesting in a young girl by the name of Asia Argento, who was seen as a blessed maiden when she had healed a sickened man. Though her good deeds and unkind heart she attract both good and bad attention, from villagers she was seen as a blessed maiden and to a certain devil, she was seen as another maiden to break. An attempt to turn Asia into a heretic, Astaroth had failed when one Naruto Uzumaki came into play, having his plan foiled by the blonde exorcist he had managed to escape with a large scar on his chest dealt by Naruto who was investigating a devil in the area. Having been saved from being seen as a heretic, she had been moved into another area due to the fear of the devil who tried to turn her. Being sent to Vatican, Though Asia did not know why she was sent to such an important place but she had a suspicion that it related to Naruto. Spending a good few years there, she was once more sent off to another location, this time Japan. Though she did not know why, Asia was happy to continue spreading the teachings of the Lord. Now here she was, 
being led towards the church by a nice young man that had helped her earlier. Issei Hyodo was his name. Thank you, Hyodo san. Asia thanked him with a bow. And no problem, Asia chan. Issei responded nervously as his eyes were glued on the foreign beauty standing before him. It was a dream come true, a blonde beauty was not something he would have expected to bump into during his time walking through the park, but her she was standing right in front of him. The god of perverts was truly looking out for him. If you are not too busy, come visit me anytime Hyodo san, Asia said with as she gave him an innocent smile. Asia thought about her time here and then her eyes widened when she remembered what the priest had ordered. Anyo, Hyodo san, do you by any chance go to Kuo Academy? Yes. Issei said a little too loudly as he looked at her with a face filled with joy. His perverted side was having a field day, not only was he in a peerage with three beauties and now a foreign beauty was attending his school. Hey Anyo, I if it isn't any trouble can I walk with you tomorrow? Asia asked a bit shyly, looking up she noticed an odd look on Issei's face but she decided to ignore it. Of course, Asia Chan. Issei replied with his joy-filled tone still present. The next morning Naruto was out of his casual clothing and now his outfit consisted of a white shirt with a black and orange tie and black pants with black boots, over his white shirt was a long black coat that reached down to his shins with golden fringes on the sides of his coat. His outfit seemed more militaristic compared to what he was used to, but it was either this or his priest robes which was not something Naruto would wear if he had a choice. Having been given orders by Michael to accompany him and Lady Gabriel to the meeting between factions, Naruto had to be dressed in his formal robes that are his general's attire. It was obvious what he chose. And it was the only formal outfit that he could sneak orange into. Being appointed as the fourth pillar general, Naruto took up that position after his father. All pillars had their own uniforms and a piece of clothing that stood out among the others, but his father had changed the entire outfit entirely. Normally, they were regular priest robes with a golden badge that held the Roman numeral IV etched on it. Minato was never one for robes, the Namikaze had a thing for long coats and that was what he had changed the outfit to. Naruto taking over did not wish to change his father's choice of outfit and kept with it, though he was not one to be formal it was something he would tolerate to keep his father's memories in place. Gabriel-sama, it is time to go. Naruto said catching the archangel's attention, Gabriel nodded in response as she flashed him a gentle smile and looped her arms around his and the duo walked out of the building. Guards flanked both of their sides which led to a car waiting to take them to Kuo Academy, the meeting place of the three factions. Gabriel was one of the four seraphs of heaven, she was an extremely beautiful woman with curly blonde hair and a voluptuous figure. Arriving early, Naruto was still seated in the car as they waited for a little while allowing Gabriel to decide on their next course of action. Spotting Asia walking with the Gremory group, Naruto decided it was best to make himself known, Naruto turned to Gabriel and spoke in a respectful tone. Gabriel sama, may I go and speak to Asia chan? Of course, Naruto kun. Gabriel answered, as another smile graced her beautiful features. Giving her a nod in thanks, the door to his right was opened by one of his officers and he stepped out of the car and began making his way towards the front of Kuo Academy. Two of his officers followed him a few steps behind and readied themselves if the group of devils tried anything towards their pillar general. His appearance had surprised the entire peerage and brought fear and dread into their hearts, the only one who seemed to have completely different emotions was Asia as a bright smile formed on her face. His two officers following him were known as Graffel, 3, and Hekadop, 4, both of them were dressed in the typical fourth pillar attire and both had black hair. Graffel kept his hair short and spiked while Hekadop allowed his hair to grow messy. Both of them were his most trusted officers and their loyalty towards him were undeniable as he knew they would willingly die for him in a heartbeat. That's him partner, the white dragon emperor. Diedrich forced himself to be heard as Issei's right arm turned shifted into the boosted gear. Bringing nervousness to the group, Rias decided it was best to proceed with words. What are you doing here, white dragon emperor? Rias asked as her eyes narrowed, and she prepared for the worst. Though she highly doubted that they could put up much of a fight against someone who had defeated Kokabiel as if he was nothing, her entire peerage was tensed and ready to spring into action if the situation deemed necessary. Are you here for Issei-kun? I am not here for the Red One. Naruto responded as he focused his attention of Asia and a smile graced his features. Asia's smile grew larger as she caught sight of Naruto's smile. I am here for Asia-chan. The entire peerage turned to face the new addition in their group. Asia blushed slightly from the attention she was receiving and looked down on the group avoiding all gazes placed upon her. Issei seemed to have reacted to that, 
Pointing a finger at Naruto he spoke in an angry tone, what do you want Asia Chan for? Do not speak to Naruto sama that way you disgusting devil, one of his guards shouted as he glared at Issei who seemed to have slightly cowered under the glare sent his way. Then his eyes set on Zenobia who was turning away from the group with a shamed look on her face, he spoke in utter rage, and you traitor, how dare you show your face from what you have done? How dare you insult a member of my family? Rius glared at the guard who had spoken before, even with a glare sent his way he did not seem to falter and he continued to glare at both Issei and Zenobia. That is enough, Graffle. Naruto said, stopping the situation before it got out of hand. Graffle hesitated for a bit before mumbling a sorry towards Naruto and remained silent, though that did not stop his glares he was sending at Issei or Zenobia. Rius san, I must apologize for my guard's outburst. Please do not take this as an offense, but Graffle merely has a hatred for devils and traitors of the church. Zenobia had tried hiding behind Kiba when she spotted Naruto but she could not do it fast enough as she was spotted right away by the guards flanking Naruto. Facing someone like Naruto who was a pillar general after her defection from the church was emotionally taxing, not only that but he was one of the few that she had looked up to during her time training. Hearing news of the young general's accomplishment she could not help but admire him for his power and success in battle and now facing her hero after she had been turned into a devil mixed guilt and shame into her already confused set of emotions. Where are my manners, it seems we have not yet formally introduced ourselves, Naruto said as he held a thinking pose before smiling at the group and spoke once more, well I'm Naruto Uzumaki, and my guards here are Graffle and Hekadot. I am Rias Gremory, and these behind me are my peerage members. Rias responded as she placed emphasis on her last name, Gremory. Though she knew Asia was not a member of her peerage she decided to ignore it, Naruto Uzumaki did not need to know even if he seemed familiar with her. Graffle snorted at that, he found it amusing that the devil was trying to stand on even grounds with his general. Turning to Naruto who seemed bored of this situation already, Graffle saw the slight nod Naruto gave him. Graffle turned to the group once more and spoke in a glee filled tone, HMPH we don't have time for you devils, we must go. Naruto turned around and began walking away but he stopped himself and turned to face Asia once more and smiled at her for the last time, it was nice seeing you again, Asia Chan. Hours had passed as Naruto spent the rest of his time at Kuo with Gabriel looking around the town, nothing seemed to have happened as he accompanied her into shops and gave her his opinion on matters of clothing. Now it was officially time for the meeting between factions. Escorting Gabriel towards the designated meeting room, Gabriel had once more looped her arms around his. Once they had reached the wooden double doors, Grapel and Hekadoff both pushed the doors open for the two to enter. Inside the room, there was a massive circular table there with chairs filled with leaders from all three factions. Seated on the fallen angel's side was a tall man in his late twenties with an average build, black hair, golden bangs and a black goatee. On the devil's side sat two figures, there was a handsome man with an appearance of his early twenties with long crimson hair and blue eyes, very similar to Rias from before. Naruto assumed they were both Gremories. Next to that man was a beautiful girl with a childish body and long black hair tied back into twin tails with blue eyes. Seeing Gabriel, Michael smiled at her and the woman with the childish body had her eyes wide open and she seemed lost for words. Issei on the other hand did not have any trouble ogling the beautiful blonde that had just entered the room. Naruto escorted her to her seat and pulled it back for her. Seating herself Gabriel flashed Naruto a smile and he nodded in response before walking a few paces backwards and stood behind Michael and Gabriel with Graffle and Hekadoth flanking him. Well it looks like our meeting can begin. The man with the golden bangs spoke up as he still looked bored. Azazel, how do you explain yourself for what one of your subordinates had done? Michael asked as he turned his attention onto the newly named Azazel, everyone else followed his example and looked at him waiting for a response. Kokabiel acted on his own. I have nothing to say. Azazel responded with an impassive wave of his hand. The others accepted the answer reluctantly and once more silence descended upon the room, none knowing what to say, so Azazel decided to speak once more, well let's get on with it. We were here to sign a peace treaty right? Shock decorated everyone's faces but Naruto's and his officers, they had managed to keep their composure but they too were shocked by the news. Michael nodded his head and spoke, yes, that was the purpose for this meeting between factions. We are on low numbers and if we continue we could likely wipe each other out. What do you say Sears X Dono? I agree, Michael Dono. The redhead replied before turning to Rias and speaking once again, I would like Rias Gremory to recite the events that had happened. Hi, Lucifer Sama. 
Ria said she knew when it was times to be respectful and when not to be and at times like this it was definitely one of those situations where he had to be. Kokabiel attacked with two followers. Sona Sitri and her peerage had decided to erect a barrier around Kuo preventing Kokabiel from escaping and destroying Japan. My peerage and I battled against him, but we were unable to do little to no harm to him whatsoever. That was when Naruto-san showed up, he had single-handedly stopped Kokabiel himself and took him away. It seems Kokabiel was acting on his own. Gabriel muttered before she nodded her head and accepted that, Michael was one to do so as well. They were not the only ones as the devils all nodded their head in acceptance as well. But before we go ahead and sign our peace treaty, I want to ask Red Dragon Emperor what do you think about this? Azazel asked as he directed his question towards Issei who seemed nervous about the attention he was receiving but he thought about it nonetheless. Issei continued to ponder and Azazel decided to speak, if we have peace then the number one priority would be repopulating, so you would have to spend most of your days with your bucko in bed making the next generation. Yes. Yes. Peace. I want to make babies with bucko. Issei shouted in glee as a perverted grin plastered itself onto his face and he nodded his head enthusiastically. His perverted mind was going wild as images of his time with Rias came into light. That is very good, Red Dragon Emperor. Michael said as he caught everyone's attention once more and he decided it was time to officially introduce Naruto into the world. Though we have one Dragon Emperor's opinion I wish for the other. Naruto-kun would you please introduce yourself? Hi. Naruto responded with a nod as his posture straightened and he adopted a militaristic look on his face. I am Naruto Uzwamki, fourth pillar general of the four pillars of heaven. I am also the white dragon emperor, and the red one's destined rival. That brought some shock into everyone's eyes as they looked at the white dragon emperor, Rias and her peerage openly showed their shock as their eyes widened into dramatic proportions. We insulted a pillar general. Rias thought in fear as she stole a glance at Naruto who did not break his posture whatsoever and held it like that. Now, Naruto-kun, how do you feel about peace? Michael asked. I believe it would be a great thing, Michael-sama. Naruto responded. I do wish to get stronger, but there are always different ways to get stronger without hostilities between factions. Then it is agreed upon. Sirzex said as the leaders prepared to proceed with the peace talks but a sudden force stopped everyone's actions and froze everything in place. Naruto and a few others were no affected including the leaders as well, Naruto looked around and decided to look out the window and saw people in robes appeared out of the massive magic circle in the sky. Narrowing his eyes, Naruto watched on as they blasted beams of magic towards their guards and they all disappeared once they made contact with the beams of magic shot their way. Magicians Michael murmured as he and the others had worked to put up a shield, they must be using something to stop the time. Gasper. Rias shouted in realization as she continued to hold on to Issei who had his boosted gear out. We can send two people into their lines to retrieve Gasper and to restore the flow of time, Sirzex said as he caught everyone's attention. With my power I can send two people there while we focus on the shield. I'll go. Rias volunteered automatically. Gasper is a member of my family, I'll go to retrieve him. I'll go with Bucko. Issei said next as he raised his hand. Sirzex nodded and began forming a magic circle. Naruto was still glaring out the window and decided he needed to provide some assistance. Graffle, patch me through to everyone in the pillar present here. Naruto said as Graffle nodded his head and used his telepathy, 5, and connected his mind to his subordinates. Fourth pillar division, I am taking command of this situation. Defend Kuo Academy from all external forces and eliminate all that are attacking, no mercy. Graffle, Hekadoth, come with me. We are holding off the enemies until they succeed. Naruto said as a pair of white dragon wings appeared behind his back and the window keeping them from the outside shattered into tiny pieces of glass and Naruto shot out of the building. Rahul and Hekadoth both followed as they jumped out of the building in pursuit of their general. We must hurry, while Naruto-kun is buying us time. Gabriel spoke in haste as everyone nodded in agreement. The battle had just begun and they were outnumbered severely and it seemed as if the flow of mages had no end. They kept appearing from the magic circle situated in the sky, showing no signs of end. Outnumbered and seemingly overpowered by the sheer number of enemies, Naruto and his division were up for one hell of a ride. Naruto was soaring into the sky, avoiding energy beams sent his way by the mages, though they were getting annoying with the constant attacks sent his way. His forces were not far away and they could regroup soon enough once Rias and Issei had completed their task of freeing their peerage member causing time to temporarily stop. Having help only from Graffle and Hekadoth for now, 
Naruto knew it would be enough. Mages were annoying, but most of them were ranged fighters, they had the advantage of range as they were soaring over the skies and his two officers did not have the ability to fly. Restricting their movements to the ground Naruto was left to fend for himself in the skies, though both Grapple and Hecadoth could provide ranged support they were ultimately useless against so many mages. Partner. Prepare for balance breaker. Naruto said as he felt the familiar sensation of magic wrapping around his body, not long his entire body was surrounded by white light. Armor finally in place, Naruto stopped his charge and scanned the battlefield before him, his division were at a major disadvantage, but they were no normal division as they had faced war than this before. Grapple, gather our forces and have them regroup here. Naruto commanded as he scanned the battlefield once more. An endless wave of enemy forces would be upon them in minutes if they continued at their pace, though large in numbers they were weak individually. Hecadoth, go with Grapple and take half of the forces and set up a defensive line around Kuo Academy, we cannot allow them to attack the representatives. Of course Naruto-sama, Grapple and Hecadoth both responded with a swift bow of their heads and they sprinted in the opposite direction. Naruto did not spare them another glacé as he focused on the incoming force of enemies. Oh ho, seems like a bunch of ants are lining up to be stepped on. Albion said with a hint of glee in his voice as he looked through Naruto's eyes, even if they were outnumbered Albion had faith his partner could easily handle himself in this situation. Your forces will be arriving soon and with the demon by your side there is nothing that can stop you. Behemoth is retired. But Jabberwock will do, having him by my side will bring forth our victory much quicker. Naruto replied, though he was confident in his abilities it was always best to have someone beside him watching his back. But it doesn't mean the old man wouldn't mind a little bit of exercise. For now we are alone in this matter. Knowing these mages, they probably sent a wave ahead of their main force. Looks like you were right, partner. Here they come now, Albion said as a force of ten or so magicians drew closer to their position. Shooting forward, Naruto moved in speeds no normal human could possibly posses and headed straight for the incoming force of ten strong. Approaching the closest magician, Naruto punched him in the gut and grabbed hold of him with one hand throwing him towards another magician who had turned to blast him Naruto moved towards the others. None of the magicians held any sort of ability in hand-to-hand -hand combat so Naruto easily demolished the small scouting party without breaking a sweat, but the main force was visible in the horizon and fighting that many would be foolish. It seemed they had the chance to amass their forces before using Gaspar's sacred gear. Well partner, looks like we might have to give the juggernaut drive a little test run eh. Naruto questioned cheerfully as more and more magicians appeared and continued their approach towards the school with no resistance whatsoever. You will not use that, Albion stated firmly as his tone turned serious. Though you are a Uzumaki, the juggernaut drive is too much for a mortal to handle, in exchange for my power to be released for a small duration of time you give up your sanity. Just throwing that option out there, Naruto responded without a care in his tone. Besides, it's not likely they will push me to use that power. Now let's engage them in battle, mind as well finish them off before they reach the school. Naruto flew towards them and accessed his other forms of magic, a massive green magic circle was created in front of him and a massive cyclone shot out from said circle, the devastating wind sent magicians in various directions fighting to stay afloat. In response to his attack, they had sent some magic of their own but due to the cyclone's sheer size it did no harm to it whatsoever. Consuming some unlucky magicians, Naruto added more magic into his spell and soon the already massive cyclone took on another size entirely. Naruto's eyes narrowed when his magic circle was forcefully shattered and his spell put to an end, looking around for the source Naruto found nothing but a large enemy force recovering from his previous spell. Though it did not last long as more and more magicians recovered and soon Naruto found himself surrounded from all sides, looking for a possible weakness in their formation Naruto could not due to their massive numbers. One by one, beams of magic from every direction were sent towards him, Naruto quickly channeled his magic around his entire body and a massive blue barrier erected itself surrounding him. Naruto's barrier continued to absorb all the magical attacks sent his way, but with so many attacks he knew it would not last very long. It being a temporary solution to the major issue he was facing, Naruto could not use Divine Dividing's ability as it required him to have made physical contact with an enemy to drain his or her powers but he had made no contact with those magicians as of yet. Adding more and more magic into his barrier, Naruto scanned around him and tried to find some way to escape from his situation, being surrounding from all sides with massive numbers keeping him from escaping. 
Expanding his barrier, Naruto continued to pour his magic into his defense and it continued to expand it into a massive size that rivaled the main building of Kuo Academy in size alone. Seeing as it had pushed enemies back, Naruto then stopped his flow of magic into his barrier and flew out of the barrier as it was penetrated from the outside. Flying higher and higher, Naruto avoided beams of magic sent his way as he continued to climb the skies Naruto finally stopped when he had broke through the barrier of clouds blanketing the earth. The moon shone brightly in the night sky, Naruto could not help but marvel at its beauty before he refocused and directed his attention down once more. Moonlight reflected off of his armor and his wings seemed to have shined brighter up here, a white magic circle appeared in front of him followed by another and another. Until there were four magic circles in all, Naruto brought his fist back that was encased in a white light and he punched the area in front of him and sent a beam of light out from the first magic circle and as it passed through the other three the beam of light had changed into a massive size and shot down towards earth. Vanishing Gurito. Vanishing Light, 1. As the beam of magical white energy descended upon the earth, magicians cold not help but look at the incoming attack in a mixture of awe and fear. Helplessness was common among all as they watched their death descend upon them, none even tried to move, it was hopeless such an enormous attack consumed such an area and it was impossible for them to escape. Silence reigned supreme as a white light consumed the entire battlefield. From the school, Gabriel and the others watched on in interest as they viewed the battle from a safe distance. Once Naruto had ascended into the skies, they did not expect such a thing to come back down. Impressed by the display of power, Sirzex and Azazel could not help but wonder how much power Naruto held compared to Issei. A second thought flashed through Azazel's mind, he was truly impressed with Naruto's control over his sacred gear and it really intrigued him that sacred gear, now he was really looking forward for the peace treaty to be signed. Having a peace treaty between factions would allow his study to soar into new heights if he got a hold of Naruto. That's one interesting sacred gear. Azazel commented with a smirk on his face, Gabriel and Michael both noticed this and shared an uncomfortable look before returning their gaze towards the battle. So much potential. Michael Dono, he is a truly terrifying pillar general. Sirzex said as he smiled. Naruto-kun has yet to show his true power. Michael replied with his usual smile and he couldn't help but feel proud of his pillar general. Even though he had to piratically force that position onto Naruto, in the end they had compromised and worked out a deal that was agreeable for both. All of a sudden the room was lit by a bright red flash and Rias and Issei both appeared accompanied by androgynous looking male with platinum blonde hair and pinkish violet eyes. Hair styled in a bob cut it also had fringes near his forehead, he also had pointed ears. Dressed in the Kuo Academy female uniform, this was Gaspar Vladi the Bishop of Rias Grimori. Oni-sama, we have returned. Rias said as she looked around and followed the direction of their gazes and saw what they were staring at. The battlefield from before where trees and buildings once sat was demolished and all that was left was a gaping crater on the earth bellow. At loss for words Rias and her now recovered peerage looked on in utter shock and a hint of fear, someone had done that while they were away for such a short time, it was just astounding. Finally composing herself and finding her voice she spoke, Oh Onisama, W who did that? Naruto Uzumaki. Sirzex responded as he continued to analyze the effects of that single attack. Descending onto the ground, Naruto looked at his handiwork, so much destruction in his attacks this one seemed to have topped all of them so far. Though he had wiped out a good portion of the enemy forces, Naruto knew they were only a portion of their total forces in all. Familiar faces came into light as members of the 4th Pillar Division poured into the battlefield surrounding him and quickly got into a defensive formation around him. Allowing his armor to vanish, Naruto scanned the battlefield once more and he felt a hand placed on his shoulder, turning around Naruto came face to face with Jabberwock. Jabberwock was a massive demon with a muscular frame and spiky crimson red hair with a long ponytail and also red eyes. Jabberwock also had a stubble on his chin and several scars across his face, the most prominent one was the traversal across his right eye down to his left cheek. You didn't save any of them for me, Naruto. Jabberwock said with a smirk on his face as he looked at the destruction caused by his commander. Whistling in amazement, his eyes narrowed as he felt multiple magical sources appear a short distance from their position. Naruto, you're getting rusty, some of them are still alive. Jabberwock, take command of the troops and eliminate the stragglers. Regroup with me when you have eliminated the rest of them. Naruto commanded as he turned and found Graffle among his men and directed his next command towards him. Graffle, you are with me. I may be in need of your skills. 
Jabberwock and the troops rushed forward and moved towards the enemy in a quick pace. Naruto watched them leave before he too ran off in the opposite direction heading towards the school. He could have easily used the divine dividing to quicken his pace, but he did not wish to get ahead of himself and lose Grapple his most reliable source of communication with his troops. Moving through trees, Naruto noticed that time around him was no longer stopped, deciding it was useless for him to give instructions as his troops as he had faith in Jabberwock. Oh ho, a battle, Naruto commented in interest as he slowed down his approach and watched the battle with interest. Azazel was battling against a devil from the wings that the woman possessed. This could be interesting. It seems that the Red Dragon Emperor has succeeded. Graffle commented as he too watched the battle with growing interest. Naruto heard him and decided not to comment as he focused on the battle at hand, neither spoke as their interest was growing by the minute. Seeing an artificial sacred gear appear in Azazel's hand, Graffle's eyes widened. Amazing, an artificial sacred gear. Looks like it's based on our balance breaker. Naruto murmured, Azazel had truly outdone himself in creating a sacred gear of that caliber. Well, looks like this battle is over. Graffle nodded his head in agreement as he witnessed Azazel slice off his own arm then attack his opponent with a swift motion finishing her off with a swift attack on his part. Looking towards his commander, he noticed the young Uzumaki had his eyes set on the Red Dragon Emperor. Deciding not to comment on that, he waited until Naruto finally spoke, Graffle we are moving, I wish to have a little scrimmage with the Red One. Nodding his head in response, Graffle followed Naruto as the two headed towards the leaders of the three factions. It didn't tail long for them to arrive, upon their arrival Gabriel smiled at Naruto and greeted him with a hug which Naruto awkwardly returned, his eyes focused solely on Issei who was shifting nervously under his gaze. Releasing him, Gabriel followed his gaze and it fell towards Issei who was nervously avoiding their eyes. Nartuo-kun, it is good to see you safe. Michael said as he drew attention to himself, smiling at the young Uzumaki. You did fantastic work out there keeping the magicians from approaching. Thank you. Michael Sama. Naruto responded in kind as a smirk found its way upon his face. Azazel san, that was an interesting sacred gear you used there. Ahahaha. You liked that brat? Azazel asked as he released an amused chuckle. That brat is my own creation. Issei Hyodo, the Red Dragon Emperor. Naruto stated as he looked at Issei with the smirk still plastered onto his face. And reincarnated devil and also the weakest Red Dragon Emperor in history. The battle between the Vanishing and Welsh Dragon has been happening for generations, and it seems that this time around the strongest White Dragon Emperor is paired with the weakest Red Dragon Emperor. Amusing is it not? The magicians that had attacked were completely wiped out by Naruto's forces with Jabberwock slightly satisfying his thirst for battle, leaving no signs of the enemy afterwards Naruto was now giddy with excitement. Naruto had been able to challenge Issei into a battle between dragons and now he only had a day to prepare for that match, though it was more for Issei rather than him. Not a single leader saw Naruto in need of preparation against Issei, so given the day Naruto had spent that time consulting Albion of the Welsh dragon's weakness. Even though Naruto knew that he had this battle in the bag, it was best to find information about his enemy even if this battle did not satisfy him he would battle Issei later on when he grew. Naruto did not know why the devil faction had agreed to such a thing, but he did not care. He had been allowed a battle against one of their servants and it would easily give him a worthy opponent. After all, even if he was the weakest red dragon emperor in all of history Diedrag still rivaled Albion in power, no matter how much the vanishing dragon denied it. With equal terms of power, the outcome of this clash would prove interesting. By accepting this there were only a few perks that the devil faction would gain, they would be able to simply gauge his power level and allow their own heavenly dragon to gain some experience but that was all that Naruto could think of as of now. Advantages and gains for his faction were minimum as well but one key advantage they would gain was fear, showing off power of one of their own would increase fear their enemies possessed. A show of power was what Naruto claimed his actions to be, knowing that Gabriel and Michael both disapproved of unnecessary violence. Even if he did not care he simply was not untouchable, being a high-ranking member in heaven he was still vulnerable and if he was seen as an enemy he could not fight off against an entire faction alone. Though he was not alone, he had loyal members in his pillar but once more against an entire faction it would not have been pleasant Naruto did not wish to go against the angel faction but he also had goals in mind that clashed with their ideals, 
Having been present in the faction since Dulio had found him Naruto didn't want to disappoint the one who had taken care of him when his parents were killed nor did he wish to disappoint the ones who had helped him along the way. Now residing in the church which was abandoned a while ago, his men had been able to fix it its former condition and set up a base of operations there, more so for his specific pillar than his the church itself. Naruto was there with his pillar standing by and getting ready for the match against Issei who they believed was going to be easily defeated, Jabberwock didn't even acknowledge the Red Dragon Emperor by his shared title with his Heavenly Dragon, that was a big deal. Jabberwock did not acknowledge anyone as a threat aside from a few field officers, Naruto, and a majority of others. Even Jabberwock acknowledged Albion as a threat, but if he dismissed Deidre as no threat that spoke volumes of how pathetic he thought of Issei. The difference of power between the Red and White Dragon Emperors were astounding, not just a mere level of power. No Naruto was leagues above Issei and the blonde exorcist had not yet stopped growing, while Issei was growing at a slow pace and it seemed as if he would stay at that weak state for quite some time. It seems you are getting ready for your little spar against the Red Dragon Emperor, Naruto-chan. A voice spoke out suddenly as Naruto leaned back in his seat and a smile played on his lips. Naruto-chan. It seems that you aren't going to bother preparing against the Red One whatsoever. You're here old man behemoth. Naruto replied with his smile widening, turning to face the source of the voice Naruto spotted an elderly man with white hair and a mustache and beard to go along with it. Are you going to watch my little match against the Red One? Jabberwock and I both will be there in case any devils think they should interfere. The newly named behemoth responded with a, a grin of his own. Walking towards Naruto, Behemoth tossed the blonde a wrapped object which Naruto caught and gave him a curious look. I got you a little present, I found that little mask you wanted. Naruto's eyes widened in shock and wonder as H quickly tore open the wrapping paper like a child of Christmas Day, hands touching the content inside Naruto lifted the object for a better look at it. The object was a mask, not just any mask but the Shinigami mask, one or also known as the Death Reaper mask. The Shinigami Mask was a sealing technique developed by the Uzumaki clan that was used to summon the Death God himself and release the souls inside his stomach, a powerful mask that was very powerful that required no sacrifice for summoning a god to do their bidding. Now with this mask, Naruto had now collected another one of the lost artifacts of his clan and there were none left to his knowledge. The Uzumaki clan being a mysterious clan, they had secrets hidden even from members of their own and with Kashina dying before she could pass down the secrets she knew to Naruto, Naruto set out on his own to find them. Thank you, old man. Naruto said as his smile widened further, placing he mask down Naruto turned to Behemoth and spoke in his usual tone, I can't thank you enough, Behemoth Gigi. With this I just might be able to bring back the Uzumaki clan to its former glory. Behemoth smirked at that, the reason he chose to follow Naruto was odd. Naruto himself was a powerful human, Behemoth knew about the Uzumaki body that allowed them go through some horrible situations and live through it, that was what had intrigued him so much. This human had something others did not, Behemoth thought that Naruto held something else aside from his sacred gear though he did not know what, Behemoth wished to. That was the first reason for following him, but now Behemoth found another to follow this blonde, Naruto's ambition. Behemoth was the only one that knew of his true goal, to surpass the greatest existence and take the Great Red's place. It was finally time for the battle, Naruto was now facing Issei in the fields of Kuo Academy. There all the leaders of the three factions were there watching, Michael and Gabriel were there to support Naruto. Sirzex and Seraphal were there to simply support Issei, though they wished to see Naruto's strength as well. Azazel was there alone to see the power between the Red and White Dragon Emperor, this allowed him to collect data further for his research. Azazel was a scientist and to collect data further was something he would have dropped his activities to do. Naruto and Issei facing off would simply give him data on balance breakers from the strongest and weakest dragon emperors in all of history, this was a chance in a lifetime. Rias and the rest of her peerage were there as well, they were watching with nervousness consuming their every actions, how could they not be nervous for one of their own when he was facing off against an enemy who could wipe out an entire army with one blow. It frightened them how powerful others were and Naruto wasn't even much older than them and younger in Rias and Akino's situation, not only that but he was a human. Are you ready for this red one? Naruto asked as the divine dividing appeared behind him and lifted him off the ground. Looking at Issei, Naruto saw the nod in confirmation and he too nodded in response, a flash of light consumed Issei's left arm as a crimson gauntlet with green gems decorating it covered his arm. Then let's begin. 
Naruto launched himself towards Issei who backed up quickly to avoid Naruto's charge, failing to do so Naruto had managed to sink a punch directly on Issei's stomach before sending another punch at the reincarnated devil's face. The impact from his blow sent Issei tumbling backwards, Naruto did not pursue his prey as he looked on in disappointment. Shaking his head, Naruto stretched his right hand and a small magical circle appeared in front of it and the magic energy Issei had sent his way was stopped just as it made contact. Issei was not done yet as he rushed forward and sent a punch towards Naruto who simply leaned to the side and kicked Issei on the stomach, allowing Issei to continue his assault Naruto merely floated there. Issei picked himself up and rushed Naruto again, though his methods weren't the best he was trying at least. Naruto was not even trying, to fight Issei he was not even a threat to Naruto. It was like a mouse trying to fight an elephant, that was a foolish thing to do as a simple stomp could easily flatten the mouse. Yet here he was trying for god knows why, Naruto looked at him in a new light. Whatever drove him to fight must have meant a ton to him, to fight someone leagues apart was something only the bravest or dumbest of men could do. Naruto was hoping Issei was the former, with that trait then the battle against the Red Dragon Emperor would have been a tad bit more amusing. So tell me, Red One, why are you trying so hard? Naruto asked as he stopped a punch from Issei and held him in place as his visage shifted into a curious one. There is always a reason a man is fighting so hard. For Bucho, Issei grunted as he tried to free his gauntlet-worn hand from Naruto's grip, progress was made as Issei began trying to wiggle his fist out. For Buku's Opai, Naruto was shocked beyond words as he blinked a few times trying to wrap his mind around the statement his destined rival had just made. Issei had been able to free himself as Nartuo focused his mind on his statement and sent a punch at Naruto who composed himself and leaned to the side and flew backwards getting some distance from him Issei. It seemed as if Issei had another idea as he rushed forward to attack Naruto and a massive white magic circle appeared before Issei, the red dragon emperor's eyes widened in shock and fear as a blast of white magic sent him flying back. Rias looked on in shock and fear as she watched her pawn soaring through the sky, she tried to rush forward but Jabberwock stopped her before she could reach the battlefield. She gave him a glare and flared her magic, but Jabberwock merely looked at her with a bored look on his face. Flaring a small bit of his own magic, Jabberwock dwarfed the tiny bit of power that Rias possessed shocking the surrounding individuals and Rias alike. Naruto won't be disturbed, once he's done with his little match I can have my own with him. Jabberwock said as he blocked Rias' passage towards the battlefield and looked down at her with boredom. Rias's peerage quickly ran to help her as two blades reached up towards Jabberwock's neck and a punch was directed at his stomach. Not even blinking an eyelash, a wave of dark red energy blasted Rias and her peerage away, Sirzex and Seraphal both turned to face Jabberwock with frowns upon their faces. Hum, is Naruto-chan still fooling around? A voice resounding around the clearing and the two Satans looked around trying to find the source of the voice. They stopped when the sound of walking was audible and a simple elderly man walked towards them with a smile on his face. Jabberwock, isn't Naruto-chan done with his little fight? Behemoth-sama, Sirzex mumbled in utter shock and fear gripped his entire body as he looked at the elderly man with a fear-consumed face. Issei was having a bad day, he did not like fighting in general, now here he was stuck fighting a general no less. The reason for even fighting at all was Rias's opai. Issei was such a pervert that he was willing to fight someone leagues more skilled and powerful than he was for simply groping a pair of opai, that said a lot about someone's character. It also said how perverted one was, but it did not matter for Issei to get to touch a pair of opai as marvelous as Rias's, he was willing to fight for it. But now Issei was starting to regret accepting that offer Rias had made him, to simply put it Rias would allow him a full minute with her opai if he fought against Naruto. Now here he was sailing across the sky with every cell in his body burning from Naruto's attack, Issei though a devil could not fly with his wings, oddly enough. Crashing against the dirt floor, Issei released a groan of pain as he began picking himself off the ground, wincing in pain Issei looked towards Naruto who held no emotions on his face. A sense of dread washed over him as he continued to stare at the emotionless blonde. Naruto was speechless, he had given his opponent the benefit of the doubt and here he was bearing the fruit of his labor. His destined rival was fighting for a pair of s, no matter how hard Naruto tried to make that phrase seem epic or at least normal it just came crashing down. It was so disappointing, from what Albion and the rest of his teachers told him about this predestined battle. 
Naruto might have thought of his opponent to be greater than what Issei was, but it seriously bothered him that his destined rival was a big pervert who fought for Opai. Words could not express how disappointed he was in his opponent, he had hoped for someone greater and worthy of giving him a battle for his life, yet here was his destined rival a shameless pervert who raved about the female body. This was going to take some time to get used to. Shaking off his shock and disappointment, Naruto saw Issei rushing forward with his fist ed backwards and ready to hit his face. Leaning to the side, Naruto allowed the fist to fly past him as Naruto grabbed hold of the pervert's arm and spun him around. Not a minute later, Naruto kicked Issei directly on the stomach and a groan was heard, Issei was then sent flying once more but this time Naruto did not allow him to recover. Appearing in front of Issei, Naruto did not relent as he punched Issei directly on the stomach, the sudden force from Naruto's attack stopped Issei's ascent and sent the poor reincarnated devil directly to the ground. Hopping backwards, Naruto created some distance between them and waited there patiently for his opponent to recover, now it was time to see how Issei retaliated. Sirzex and Seraphal both looked at the former general with nervousness in their actions. Behemoth didn't seem to notice the nervous behavior or did not care, most likely the former. Sirzex decided to speak first, Behemoth-sama, what are you doing here? We thought you were lost along with Lucifer-sama during the Great War. Hmm, who are you brat? Behemoth questioned as he looked at Sirzex in a bored fashion. I am Sirzex Lucifer, I took the title after Lucifer-sama's demise. Sirzex introduced as he composed himself and looked at Behemoth directly in the eyes. That was a big mistake. As his eyes met the former general's Sirzex seemed to have been staring into an eternal abyss of shadows. Removing his eyes from Behemoth's, Sirzex could not help but feel fear from the man before him, Sirzex was powerful indeed but Behemoth was in another level. Leading the original Lucifer's army Behemoth was worthy of taking over after the death of said Satan, yet during the final clash where Lucifer lost his life Behemoth vanished without a trace and devils now assumed he was killed by the clashing dragons. So you took over his position, E.H. Brat? Behemoth asked in a blank tone. His eyes bore into the current Lucifer's and he shifted his eyes to the devil standing a little ways away from him. And what about you? I am Seraphal Leviathan, current holder of the Leviathan title. Seraphal responded with her usual playful tone gone and replaced by a serious one that seemed out place for someone like her. Situations like this one demanded her serious side and acting childish to someone of Behemoth's caliber was simply foolish. Behemoth studied the two closely as multiple thoughts ran amuck in his mind, they did not interest him in the slightest. It was as simple as that, they were merely brats who took over the names of the former Satans nothing more to it. But what they were doing was keeping him from watching his students fight, looking at them Behemoth waved his hand in a dismissive manner and spoke, you do not interest me, keep quiet while I watched Naruto-chan fight. Jabberwock, are you keep those brats from interfering? What do you think I've been doing old man? Jabberwock questioned in a gruff tone. Behemoth merely nodded his head and turned to watch the battle commence with no emotions displayed on his visage. The two Satans did not seem to react to that comment as they nodded their heads in response and Behemoth turned to watch the battle commence. Jabberwock did as well, not even sparing them another glance the father and son watched their rival, student engage the perverted devil in a battle. Rias seemed to have recomposed herself after that display of power that Jabberwock had displayed, the feeling of helplessness was still present inside of her and her body seemed to have been frozen during that display. Turning to her brother Rias asked in a shaky tone, Oh Onisama who are they? Rias, do not step out of line with these two. Sirzex said in a dangerously serious tone, his eyes bore into his sister's all playfulness gone. That is Behemoth Sama, former general of the original Lucifer's army. I can't stress this enough, do not step out of line. Once Issei recovered, the perverted devil stood on his shaky legs and pulled out that ring Azazel had given him. Placing it around his arm, Issei grunted in pain as his muscles felt as if they were bathing in a sea of fire, the attacks Naruto had delivered had been painful even if his durability was raised he simply could not take blows of that level. Magic power flowing into that ring as he was consumed in a red light and soon Issei had red dragon armor decorated with green jewels covering his entire body. When the light died down, Naruto looked at him with an amused face. How could he not be amused, his opponent had entered balance breaker even if it did not seem very impressive Naruto would make do with that he had. Issei rushed forward with newfound speeds and shot towards Naruto who simply smirked in glee and vanished before Issei could even reach him, appearing behind Issei. 
Naruto tried to grab hold of him but Issei managed to turn in time and punch Naruto directly in the face. Flying backwards Naruto created some distance from him and his smirk widened as he touched the area where the punch had made contact with. A flash of light formed in his hands as it lengthened into the shape of a sword, once the light vanished Ascalon was seen into his hands. Issei seemed to have little knowledge of his blade as he rushed forward regardless of the blade in Naruto's hands, as he approached to punch him Issei felt immense pain in his chest. Eyes widened into dramatic degrees Issei looked down at his chest and his eyes widened further upon seeing the massive cut that had formed. Armor and all was sliced and his cut flesh was visible through his damaged armor, turning to look at Naruto who had lost his smirk and now a bored expression replaced his former expression. Come on, perverted dragon, you were supposed to dodge that, Naruto exclaimed in disappointment, waving his arms in disbelief Naruto spoke again, if you can't beat me with your balance breaker then you won't be a match when I'm in mine. The loss of a exciting battle had diminished his interest in this fight and his lazy personality seemed to be taking over. Grumbling, Naruto decided enough was enough and he needed to finish this so he could enjoy a nice bowl of ramen, that sounded very pleasing at the moment. Tossing his blade into the air the blade vanished into shower of sparks just like how it had appeared, Naruto was engulfed in a bright white light and soon his body was covered in white dragon armor with blue jewels decorating it. Issei had recovered from Naruto's attack and tried to move his body but all he could accomplish was a turn of it and Naruto slammed into him and carried him into the air. Issei struggled to escape the blonde's grasp to no avail and a punch from Naruto shattered his already damaged armor and pain followed that punch. Not long before, Issei was thrown from the sky towards the earth below him, as gravity took on its role and Issei began plummeting towards the ground. Bringing both arms forward a massive white magical circle appeared before him and a beam of behemoth proportions shot towards the falling form of Issei. Once the white beam of light consumed Issei, it blinded everyone near the area and silence once more took the field. The fight with Issei ended with a definite victory for Naruto, the outcome was predictable not a single one believed Issei could win that. Now nothing seemed so exciting anymore, his dreams of a glorious battle between rivals had vanished and now was replaced by utter disappointment. Now Naruto was situated in his office at the 4th Pilar's headquarters, after the fight Naruto had gone on a ramen run. Normal people could only eat a few bowls, but not Naruto he had eaten over a dozen bowls and still asked for more. On top of that, Naruto did not seem to gain a single pound from all that ramen, the blonde claimed that the food for the gods did not harm. Others like Behemoth believed it was due to his Uzumaki metabolism, they were a mysterious clan indeed with an assorted array of abilities. Now the powerful leader of the fourth pillar laid there on top of his desk defeated, his most powerful foe up to date yet had taken him down faster than anyone Naruto had ever faced in combat. His great foe was known as Paperwork, a dangerous foe that preyed upon the ones that led, such a foe was not easily defeated like normal opponents. Normal opponents once they were defeated they stayed defeated. No not Paperwork that deadly fiend did not simply die once they were finished. No they kept multiplying after one was defeated two more would take its place. This enemy was more frightening than any god or dragon and in Naruto's eyes more powerful than the former and latter combined. I'm tired, can I take a break, Aoi-chan? Naruto asked in a childish tone as he turned to face the person standing a little ways behind him. Aoi Kunida was an attractive teen with long black, blue hair and blue eyes. Her attire consisted of the fourth pillar black and white long coat over her usual white dress shirt and tie, finishing her outfit was a simple mini skirt. Naruto-kun, you need to take your position as general more seriously. Aoi replied as a sigh was released from her lips, looking over at Naruto she saw the childish pout decorating Naruto's visage. Aoi was used to Naruto's childish tendencies, it was odd how powerful individuals acted, Naruto for one was laid back and childish but when it came to battle, Naruto completely changed in behavior and personality. Having been with Naruto for years she had been used to his behavior, but there were still some things that she could not get used to. Naruto-kun, you didn't even do any work. All you did was write ramen on our supply list. That's a good day's work right there. Naruto responded as he pointed his finger at the single word he wrote. Aoi released another sigh and face palmed in exasperation, no matter how many times Naruto and her went through this situation this was one of the things she could not get used to. Naruto continued to pout but another idea formed in his mind, reaching over Naruto grabbed both Aoi's hands and looked into her eyes, Aoi-chan, will you do it with me? Do it with me, H-E-C can't possibly be T-thinking T that. 
Aoi thought frantically as a massive blush formed on her face. As she thought of her words more and more, the blush grew larger. It seemed humanly impossible for her face to get any redder than it already was but Aoi did not seem to have any issues with that. W what a re why you? The door leading into Naruto's office was pushed open and Jabberwock poked his head inside and looked at the two holding hands, deciding to ask about the situation Jabberwock questioned the two with his eyebrows raised, what are you two doing? Nothing. Aoi shouted in shock and embarrassment as she removed her hands from Naruto's grasps and ran towards the exit, as she passed by Jabberwock who was blocking her from exiting she shoved the poor demon into a wall and continued running out of the room with her face burning with embarrassment. As she ran away, she left behind a confused Naruto and a cursing Jabberwock. What was that about? Naruto asked in confusion as he continued looking at the retreating figure of Aoi Kunida and once she vanished from view he redirected his attention towards Jabberwock. Jabberwock who had finally gotten himself out of the wall, he looked at Naruto in disbelief. Slamming his head against the door frame, he shouted with disbelief evident in his voice, how can you be so dense? What were we supposed to do again? Naruto asked as he whistled cheerfully, the blonde exorcist was currently walking down the busy streets of Tokyo with Aoi following closely behind. She had exchanged her long black coat in favor of a simple blazer making her seem more and more like a schoolgirl, while Naruto changed his coat for a simple jacket with orange on it. We were supposed to set up a permanent base of operations at the abandoned church in Kuo, but you got distracted by ramen and now we're in Tokyo. Aoi responded with another sigh. It seemed that being around Naruto she seemed to sigh a lot more than often. Looking at the blank look that Naruto sported, Aoi looked at him strangely. Aoi-chan, can we not talk about work here? Naruto questioned as he looked at her with a smile on his face. Kunida continued to look at him strangely, Naruto seemed to take that as a yes as he grabbed her hand and led her around the crowd. Let's have some fun. Aoi knew Naruto was childish, and to dismiss a mission in favor of fooling around in a city was exactly something that everyone would expect from Naruto. And here they were, two high-ranking officers of heaven enjoying the joys that Tokyo had to offer. Like normal teenagers, the two in many ways seemed normal, how could they not? No normal general of a task force and his right-hand woman would simply go walking around Tokyo City like two tourists enjoying a nice vacation. That was how the two spent most of their day, they had enjoyed the joys offered by Tokyo City, though unlike teenagers their age they had managed to destroy a few machines in an arcade they had visited and Naruto had consumed more food than any normal person when they had ate. All in all, it was a pretty normal day for the two, spending so much time together one would think that Aoi would have gotten over her shyness around Naruto but she had managed to somehow keep that to this day. Aoi would not have admitted it to anyone but she had a good time with Naruto as they moved from place to place all over Tokyo. It was odd how many would think people with similar personalities would be attracted to each other, but the saying of opposites attracting was not so far off either. Naruto was an idealist while Aoi was an realist, both completely different in many subjects. But in this world, there existed both idealists and realists a combination of both would bear spectacular results. Realists thought practically while idealists thought through ideals and sometimes dreams, idealists flew high without a care in the world and realists kept them from flying too close to the sun. And without idealists, realists would have never flew off the ground in the first place. Currently, the two were walking side by side heading towards the park situated a little ways away from the restaurant they had dined at. Naruto still had his cheerful smile decorating his face, as they entered the park and continued walking. A familiar sensation filled his mind as his body unconsciously moved and headed off of the road and towards the woods. Aoi looked at her commander in confusion and decided to ask, Naruto-kun, what are you doing? Sorry about that, Aoi-chan. Naruto replied suddenly as he flashed her a cheeky smile and returned to the path. I got a little distracted. Aoi could only nod her head in response, she did not know what to do in this situation so a nod was what she had produced. The two continued walking and Naruto could sense the familiar energy signature of the Welsh dragon a little ways ahead of him with another familiar energy signature, walking forward Naruto quickened his pace and Aoi followed without hesitation. Not long after they spotted Issei Hyodo and Asiya Argento together, making their presence known Naruto coughed into his hands and caught their attention. Issei was immediately on guard as his entire body tensed and his eyes widened in shock and fear still remembering that power Naruto had displayed during their little spar. 
Unconsciously taking a step backwards, the boosted gear quickly formed around his arm and Issei held up his shaky arm high up allowing Naruto to see his sacred gear. Gathering whatever courage he had left in his body Issei spoke in a tone that reeked of fear, what are you doing here? Aoi took a step forward and put up a protective arm in front of Naruto and she narrowed her eyes at the Red Dragon Emperor. Asia nervously looked between both parties and tried to say something but she too was consumed by fear, surely they would not fight here of all places, well that was what Asia believed. Asia was still a member of the church, but her activities with the reincarnated devil had brought some negative responses from some members of the church. Aoi on the other hand did not even see Issei as a threat, but her actions were simply protocol, responding to the demand she spoke in a serious tone, it's none of your business devil, but if you are looking for a fight I will respond in kind. This situation was quickly spiraling out of control and it seemed a fight could easily break out between Aoi and Issei at any minute and to make matters worse a magic circle with the Grimori family crest appeared a little few meters away from them. In a flash of bright red light, Rias Grimori and her peerage appeared there and their eyes widened in shock as they spotted Naruto and Aoi. Quickly taking action, they surrounding Issei and Asia as they prepared for the worst and prayed to whatever devils could for the best. Rias was nervous, how could she not? Naruto was standing before her with another human and she could only assume it was another exorcist and if she was in Naruto's company then she was a monster in battle as well. Gathering all of her strength and calming her nerves, Rias had composed herself and was now ready to speak, what are you doing here white dragon emperor? If you are here for Issei-kun then we won't let you get to him without a fight. Naruto was rather impressed by their will to protect one of their own, it almost made him sad that he would have to break that little group up, key word here was almost. But he could allow them to exist for now, even if he was here for Issei the reincarnated devil would not have been alive if he truly wished for his death. A simple banishing burrito, banishing light, one would have easily vanquished the perverted devil, he didn't need to be creative to destroy an enemy. Well as great as that sounds, I have to say no to that offer. That seemed to have brought relief among others as everyone seemed to relax even if was at the slightest, Aoi didn't relax but her body lost a bit of tension. The tension was still thick and hostility towards Naruto was high due to the beating he gave Issei not so long ago, not that Naruto could blame them. But he was now curious, so deciding to word his curiosity Naruto asked with an raised eyebrow, so you were planning on attacking me with a ragtag group of reincarnated devils, frankly I am insulted. The insulted party kept their mouths shut preventing any words from escaping their lips as many of them frowned at the jab, though the words Naruto had spoken were true. Rias did not constructed her peerage with much thought, many people like her rival Sona Sitri who constructed her peerage with her tactful mind and was a formidable enemy when in a raiding game. Rias on the other hand had a big heart and pretty much reincarnated half her peerage out of pity, Issei was more of an intellectual decision but some of the others were not. Overall, the peerage were weak, under the command of a sheltered high class devil they did not have much combat experience against more powerful enemies and thus proved themselves to be nothing more than inexperienced fools. That much aside they were nice people, er devils, that would get them pretty far in this cruel world, not really but Naruto liked looking at the positive side of situations. Now did you really think a small group like that could have done me or Aoi-chan any harm? Naruto asked once more before his eyes fell on Asia who was shifting around nervously and looking at the ground avoiding all eye contact from anyone present. Asia Chan, no need to be nervous about being around devils now. With the peace treaty in place, our factions should be friendlier towards one another. Issei-san, though I do wish to make something clear. Naruto said with seriousness taking over his voice, our dragons are destined to fight each other in the future, sooner or later we shall fight once more and I hope for a better fight than what you put up last time. For now we are acquaintances and no harm will come to you or your friends as long as the peace treaty is in place. But you stand in the way of my goal, one day I will surpass the Welsh dragon. And on that day, Naruto-san we will stand by Issei-kun's side. Rias responded with sharp tone, her eyes were filled with determination as she showed off her loyalty towards her pawn and Naruto was rather impressed by this. You stand by that weakling's side and we stand by our commander's side. A voice rang from the woods around them and shadows appeared around the trees and came closer to them, Rias and her peerage Issei included all took a few steps back and looked around them with suspicion and a bit of fear in their eyes. Hekadoth appeared from the shadows and moved to Naruto's right and had his spear ready in hand. Hekadoth, what are you doing here? Naruto asked in his usual cheerful tone. Hekadoth raised an eyebrow before he replied with a sigh, 
Naruto-sama, I was here to make sure you did not get lost like you always do. Also, we finished preparations and the church is restored to its former conditions before it was abandoned. Naruto looked at him with a disbelieving expression as Aoi decided to comment on that, it's true Naruto-kun, you tend to have an issue with direction. That was the reason Michael-sama assigned Kunyeda-san to be your bodyguard. Face it Naruto-sama, you have a horrible sense of direction. Hekadoth supplied with a smirk on his face. Naruto crossed his arms and pouted like a child, I do not have a bad sense of direction. The entire Grimori peerage looked at the scene with disbelief. It was odd how some of the most powerful people had the weirdest quirks, and it seemed that Naruto was no different from that. True enough Naruto was a child in every way, but when times called for it he could become serious and fit the role of general in every way, but the other times he was a laid-back idiot. The previous tension-filled air was vanquished by the odd scene that was playing before them, Naruto had decided to end this in turn to face the Grimori group with a cheerful smile on his face. Well, it was nice talking to you guys again but I have to go. Naruto said with a cheerful wave of his hand before his eyes fell on Asia and he asked her with his usual tone, Asia-chan are you coming back to the church? Asia looked between Issei and Naruto before she bowed towards Issei and his group of devil friends and ran towards Naruto, approaching them she turned back once more and said, bye, Issei-san I hope we can do this again sometime. Kashina Uzumaki was a powerful exorcist during her time alive, along with her husband she utilized the rare amount of skill she possessed with seals in open combat. Not only that but she came from a long line of powerful human mages and exorcists alike, though the Uzumaki clan was destroyed during the last war, their teachings and abilities lived on in her. Her abilities did not rely solely on seals, oh no. She had a powerful familiar by her side, a Kayubi no Kitsune. A yukai that was said to rival ultimate class devils, they were truly powerful beasts, but this one was different from the rest. It did not utilize magic like the others oh no, it used something more powerful, the mysterious power known as chakra. It was only possible to unlock that source of power when utilizing senjutsu, but not many yukai could access chakra without senjutsu but here was this kayubi who could easily do it. That left some questions on how Kashina had died during that night, with such a powerful yukai under contract it was a wonder how she had died. But nonetheless she and her husband had perished that day and left behind their legacy, Naruto Uzumaki. But she was unable to leave her anything except a final gift, her contract with the Kayubi. On her last breaths she had spoke with the Kayubi and she had begged it to help watch over her son, something that she could no longer do. Kurama was the Kayubi's name, it watched over its former contractor's son it was not impressed. Though Naruto was powerful and lived up to the name of the Uzumaki clan well, it was not ready for another contractor. But it had made a promise to Kashina to watch over Naruto, even if it did not like the brat it would do it nonetheless. Residing in a cave deep inside the underworld some place where no one would think to look for a massive nine-tailed fox, Kurama had gone into slumber and decided to only show itself when it deemed Naruto ready. Now here it was, awake and ready to speak to Naruto. Even if Kurama did not accept Naruto to be to be its contractor, a promise was made and it would have to uphold it no matter what. But in Kurama's eyes, Naruto was nothing like his mother. Kashina had a fiery attitude and a knack for seals and was quite intelligent, Naruto on the other hand seemed more like an idiot than what he was made out to be. It knew that Naruto's personalities shifted on and off the battlefield, but it did not respect the blonde whatsoever. Naruto did not live up to the Uzumaki name, Kurama had known some of the Uzumaki for centuries and they were nothing like him. But that was not the true reason he hated Naruto, during Kashina's death, it had been accused for causing it and thus some exorcists were sent to hunt it down. Having developed a hatred for exorcists and seeing Naruto become one it hated that part of the blonde, nothing else was wrong except the immense hatred for exorcists in Kurama's heart. The audacity of those humans, to think that it would be the cause of its contractor's death. The pride of the Kayubi had been damaged that day and gave birth to hatred that could rival all. A dragon was a beast of great power, many have died fighting these creatures of mass destruction and few lived to tell the tale. Yet two dragons known as the two heavenly dragons were slain and their souls sealed into sacred gears. The powers of these dragons if used correctly could topple gods, every generation of dragon emperor the constant feud between both supremacy and domination had been fought resulting in deaths of one or the other. At times the dragons did not clash at all leaving both alive. Now this generation of dragon emperors were completely different, one known as the strongest and the other the weakest. Aoi-chan, do it, 
Naruto commanded his closest friend and subordinate. Aoi nodded her head in response, walking forward she uncapped a marker and began drawing on the surface Naruto had instructed her to draw on. Though it was something odd for her to do, Naruto had ordered her specifically as her commander other than a friend so Aoi could not do anything else but comply with his orders. Once she was done, Naruto grabbed hold of the marker and began doodling near the area where Aoi had drawn on from before. Finishing the last detail, Naruto stood up with a satisfied smile as the young general handed Aoi the marker. Walking out of the room, Aoi followed Naruto closely from behind but she stole a glance at her superior's handiwork and like previous events Aoi released a sigh. What they were drawing on was none other than Hekadote, the second officer to gain his complete trust. Naruto being the child he was, Naruto had found a sleeping Hekadoth and decided to doodle on said officer. As Naruto and Aoi both left, both of them were supposed to be at a meeting but Naruto blew it off like usual and had Behemoth take his position there. This was a very common even that it would have been out of place if Naruto had shown up, and Aoi had just about given up trying to persuade Naruto into going to those meetings. Navigating through the maze of hallways in their base of operations, Naruto was cheerfully whistling as usual. Members of the fourth pillar passed by and bowed their heads in respect towards Naruto who merely waved them off with a cheery grin plastered on his face. Once they reached their destination, Naruto made eye contact with Aoi and they gave each other a wordless nod. A white light shimmered in Naruto's hands as it took the form of a sword and Ascalon soon materialized into Naruto's hands. Aoi didn't draw the katana she usually carried around with her. It would have been too dangerous to fight against someone like Naruto with a simple blade, she would need to use her holy sword. Like Naruto, Aoi's right hand was consumed by a pink light as it soon take the form of another sheathed katana and her blade materialized into her hands. This sword was wrapped in a layer of bandages as Aoi quickly removed the bindings and her blade was finally shown to Naruto. Aoi's blade was sheathed in a simple black scabbard with the tip of it coated in a layer of gold, the handle was covered with simple black cloth and the tip held a golden ornament like every other katana. Naruto noticed the design of her blade's guard was no different than any other traditional katana, what intrigued Naruto was the design of its guard. Her previous sword held no design as it was just a simple guard but this one was designed with lines that looked like the sun's rays, giving her a curious glance, Aoi didn't answer his immediate question as she unsheathed her blade and showed off its traditional blade. Naruto could not help but admire the sword's beauty, it was simple yet beautiful. Naruto-kun, you may have a holy sword now so I can't hold back. Aoi said as her blade was wrapped in a layer of pink magical energy and she prepared to attack. Bring it on, Aoi-chan. Naruto replied as he readied his sword and prepared for her attack, it was always Aoi who would attack first. For years they had sparred and Aoi always attacked and it became something of a habit now for said exorcist, this time around Aoi was knew that she was by far superior when it came to any form of kenjutsu, sword techniques, and Naruto was still in the stages of learning a style that he wished to build off of. Naruto's eyes lingered on the blade and he finally realized what made this blade so special. Aoi-chan, you're really planning on using your family's prized sword. Naruto asked all of sudden and cut Aoi off from her concentrated state. Looking at him in a bewildered state she couldn't help but be shocked that Naruto had deduced what weapon she was using so quickly, the blade she was currently wielding was her family's blade passed on to the next generation, knowledge of the blade was closely guarded by the Kunyeda family and yet Naruto had known about it, it was odd how Naruto found out since Aoi had never spoken a word about holding onto said blade. How did you? Aoi didn't get to finish as Naruto waved her off with a lazy hand. I didn't know Aoi-chan, thanks for telling me. Naruto replied with a cheeky grin plastered on his face, Aoi face palmed in disbelief before she composed herself and prepared to attack. Shifting her position, Aoi studied Naruto and prepared to attack but she was cut off when Naruto charged forward instead and brought his blade down in a vertical slash. Parrying it with her blade, Aoi released a grunt as Naruto added more force to his attack. Pushing back, Aoi and Naruto both jumped backwards to create some distance from each other as they once more stood a good distance away from each other. Rushing forward, Aoi sent a swift cut towards Naruto who managed to avoid the blow as he leaned to the side and allowed Aoi's blade to move past him. But before Naruto could react, Aoi's blade was once more coated in a pink glow and his eyes widened in shock, Naruto managed to take a step backwards and successfully created a bit of distance from her. 
Nashiki Hiyaka Midair Zakura, Second Ceremony 100 Flower Storm, Aoi was consumed in a cloak of pink energy as pink Sakura petals danced around her body and she twisted her body and slashed at Naruto. Several pink lines were formed and they took on the form of wave-like patterns that seemed to destroy everything in its vicinity. Bringing his blade to block her attack, Naruto was not as fortunate as several slashes formed in his clothes and tore a good portion of his outfit off. Pain accompanied the newly formed slashes on his body as Naruto quickly created some distance from his opponent and released a grunt of pain as his new wounds were still tender. Aoi-chan really has grown stronger since the last time we sparred. Naruto thought, he was clearly pleased with this information, but damn did it hurt to feel firsthand at what she was capable of. Raising his sword, Naruto charged forward and ignored the burning pain from Aoi's previous attack. Seemingly predicting his movements, Aoi shifted her sword into a better position and rushed forward. Her nimble fingers got a better grip of her scabbard and she swung it forward at Naruto who ducked under the slash and quickly parried a swift slash Aoi sent towards him. Using his free hand Naruto grabbed hold of Aoi's scabbard and yanked it out of her grasp before throwing it to the side. Aoi didn't have enough time to retaliate as Naruto brought down his blade and she blocked his attack with her own blade. Taking this time retaliate Aoi shifted her weight and used whatever strength she could muster at the moment to push Naruto back. Jumping back, Naruto decided it was best to use his technique now. Looking at Aoi, Naruto held Ascalon in front of him and Divine Dividing appeared behind him. Aoi-chan, now you get to see a new trick I created. Naruto said with a smile on his face as his body glowed in a brilliant white light. Shiro Ayu, White Paladin, Naruto called out as Albion took this as his cue to begin the process. More and more light appeared and blinded Aoi as she looked away avoiding the bright light, once the light died down Naruto once more donned his white dragon armor. But this time, unlike his regular armor the color scheme shifted adding another color into the combination of white and blue. A layer of gold appeared on the edges of his armor and Ascalon was strapped to the back and it too held a layer of gold on it. Landing on the ground. Naruto grabbed his sword from its stored area and held it ready for another clash. Aoi mimicked his example and readied herself against Naruto as she studied Naruto's new armor with a wary gaze. New armor formed through the combination of Ascalon and the Divine Dividing. Aoi thought to herself as she continued to study Naruto. It seems to be a subspecies balance breaker, and Naruto-kun's power should be dramatically increased. Aoi-chan do you like it? Naruto asked in his usual cheerful tone as he showed off his newly created balance breaker to Aoi who nodded slightly before he continued speaking, Albion says I was strong enough to access this balance breaker after I had beaten that perverted devil. Though I do have a feeling that he was keeping it under wraps until I had beaten his rival. Aoi took that information without a response as she gripped onto her blade tighter than before and prepared to charge. Naruto however noticed this action and took the liberty of charging before her appearing in front of her with speed that Aoi could barely keep up with she was able to bring her sword down to form a weak defense from his incoming sword. Sparks flew as their blades crossed once more and Naruto's strength seemed to increase drastically as Aoi was being pushed back rather quickly, before Aoi could counter his actions Naruto unarmed her in a swift swing of his blade. Now weaponless Aoi couldn't reach her blade in time before she found Naruto's sword poised to slice off her throat, holding her hands up in defeat she released a sigh. Seeing that Naruto released his balance breaker and removed Ascalon from Aoi's neck, once his armor was released Naruto let loose a groan as the strain from donning that armor kicked in. Shiro Ayu was a subspecies balance breaker he and Albion had worked on that combined Ascalon and Divine dividing into a single set of armor, the advantages of this new armor was that it boosted his physical stats to new heights but his magic abilities drastically decreased. His regular balance breaker was a perfect combination of physical and magical abilities, Shiro Ayu simply boosted his speed and strength to new levels that were seemingly impossible for his regular armor to obtain. Divine Dividing could easily reach up to light speed, but his human body was a limit so Naruto could not access that level of speed without damaging his body. Now with Shiro Ayu, he had access to that speed and it was amazing how fast he could move and catching Aoi off guard like that was the use of a bit of his newfound speed and strength. Though the battle was dictated by skill before which Aoi could have easily won, but with surprise Naruto managed to catch her off guard and overpowered Aoi with brute strength and speed. Aoi had recovered his fallen weapon and was now standing in front of Naruto with a curious look on her face, wrapped an arm around Aoi, Naruto began guiding her away ignoring the odd look she was sending his way. Aoi-chan, I'm hungry now how about we get some lunch? 
Naruto asked as if that previous spar had not just happened. Fine, but we're not having ramen. Aoi replied as she walked forward leaving behind a shock and saddened Naruto who looked like a kicked puppy from her previous comment. Naruto and Aoi were walking back from the cafeteria with nothing much to do, the meeting was over and Behemoth would soon debrief them on the events of said meeting. Though it wasn't like Naruto would really do much about the information aside from sleeping through those meetings unless there was something that actually required his interference. Though Behemoth lead the pillar more than he did, Naruto still had everyone in loyalty but Behemoth just did most of the technical work. Odd as it was, Behemoth seemed to be okay with this arrangement though the only ones who knew why he was okay with such a strange arrangement was Naruto and Jabberwock. Speaking of Jabberwock, Naruto was wondering where he was, the demon would usually be near the stables where he kept his pet dragon, yes pet dragon. Jabberwock was powerful demon that was for sure, having the power and skill to match Naruto in combat was something else as the blonde held a longinus as well as training form some powerful individuals. Rivaling in power, Jabberwock was able to do something that Naruto had not even imagined, he had made a dragon into his pet. As strange as it sounded it was the truth, even to this day Naruto did not know how he was able to force such a prideful beast in submission. Even Albion took five years to coax into a partnership, that took five years and Jabberwock just tamed a dragon in less than a day. Even if that was the case, Naruto respected his rival enough to not ask about it and everyone seemed to follow Naruto's example and did not ask about the subject. Now wonderful news was that Naruto did not really need Jabberwock at the moment, but it would be best if he knew where Jabberwock was in case he needed someone to blame. Entering his office, Naruto found Behemoth behind his desk and he looked at the elderly demon with a questioning gaze. Behemoth stopped writing the report and placed his pen down and greeted the two, Naruto-chan, Aoi-chan. Old man, Naruto greeted with his usual grin in place. Behemoth-sama, Aoi greeted with a short bow. E.H. Brat, sit down I have some news involving you. Behemoth said as he gestured to the two chairs situated in front of Naruto. Shrugging his shoulders, Naruto sat himself down and Aoi followed his example and seated herself as well. Well, Michael-san has some new orders for you. What could it be? Naruto asked with a curious gaze, multiple thoughts ran amuck in his mind at the moment but he chose to ignore it in favor of looking at Behemoth who was about to deliver to him his answer. School. E.H. You heard me brat, Michael-san wants you to go to school. Behemoth said with a grin of his own. Seeing the shocked faces of both Naruto and Aoi, he couldn't help but release a chuckle and continuing to speak, Michael-san and the other pillar generals agreed that you should be spending more of your time as a person of your age and less time goofing off. B but, I'm a pillar general. Naruto replied as an argument came to mind. Behemoth seemed to be enjoying this as his grin turned into a toothy smile and he responded to his student's words, true, but I do most of the letting and you just well do whatever you do. Seeing as I do all the paperwork and attend all the meetings, we have decided you have some extra time on your hands so why not attend school, it was Gabriel San's suggestion. If you took your job more seriously and instead of screwing around then maybe you wouldn't have to go to school. I'll do it, Nartuo answered immediately as he tried to desperately find a way out of school, I'll take over again and I will do everything that you do. That'll keep me out of school, right? No, Brad it already has been decided that you will have to attend school. Behemoth responded as he returned to his paperwork without another word leaving his mouth. But old man, I can't attend school, it's so boring. Naruto said as his tone sounded more like a whining child's rather than a general's. Aoi was busy processing this as a thin smile appeared on her lips thinking about the prospect of Naruto attending school like a regular teenager. It was very amusing, someone as carefree and reckless as Naruto in a school setting like that was just a too good of a opportunity to pass up. Naruto-kun, I think you should attend. Aoi said drawing attention to her and she looked at Naruto with a gentle smile on her face. Naruto-kun, this could be a good opportunity for you. You do have too much time on your hands so it would be best to do something worthwhile, and besides Gabriel-sama and Michael-sama are only looking out for your well-being. Even you're siding with them. Naruto said glumly as he began pouting like a child and crossed his arms in defiance. I will not attend school. I would actually have to work there. Michael San said that it's either that or your dining funds. Behemoth informed suddenly as he finished his first stack of paperwork and tied it up in a bundle before moving on to the next pile without even looking up. Aoi Chan, you have to attend as well. Michael San said wherever Naruto goes you go. 
Ha! Naruto shouted suddenly as he pointed a finger at Aoi in victory. I do question why Michael-san is sending a bunch of delinquents to school. Behemoth murmured to himself as he ignored the growing annoyances seated in front of him. This was such a normal occurrence that he had learned to ignore them once they started their childish arguments. Naruto was currently wearing a black blazer with a white dress shirt underneath and a set of matching black pants and brown dress shoes. This was the boys' uniform of Kuo Academy. Aoi was dressed in the girls' uniform which consisted of long-sleeved dress shirt with vertical linings, a black ribbon on the collar, a black shoulder cape which Aoi decided to remove and finally a red skirt with white accents. The duo were not alone in this situation as Jabberwock was dressed in an outfit similar to Naruto's which he wondered how they had managed to find something of his size and that also brought up a question as to how Jabberwock was willing to even put it on. Next to him was Hekadoth dressed similar to Naruto as well but instead of ignoring the ribbon as Naruto and Jabberwock did, Hekadoth decided to wear it. Now on to our torture. Naruto said with a not so cheery voice as he and the rest of the males in the group walked on in a mixture of emotions. Naruto was dejected about having to attend school, Jabberwock's face held a permanent scowl and Hekadoth was emotionless of this entire ordeal, but Naruto knew his second most well-trusted officer was quite annoyed with this situation. Originally there were supposed to be four males in the group, but Graffle has managed to weasel his way out of this horrid situation and in place his brother Yada was forced into a uniform and sent off to school. Originally this was supposed to be an all-male group as they sent Naruto off to school and a group of his most trusted officers, but Aoi was command to be here as everyone knew that Naruto would have most likely gotten lost or wouldn't have gone without Aoi there. The relationship between Naruto and Aoi could be simplified as best friends and trusted comrades, though Aoi had an obvious crush on Naruto who seemed to be as dense as a rock in these romantic situations where he simply did not understand what was happening. As the group made their way closer to Kuo Academy, Naruto was still dejected about having to attend school but he recomposed himself as he had an image to keep, though not a single soul knew who he was aside from the devils. Well it wasn't like he had a choice as Aoi simply slapped him in the back of his head and told him to behave, so Naruto had to recompose himself or else Aoi would have done worse. Jabberwock and Aoi both flanked Naruto as Yada and Hekadoth pulled up from the rear end of the group, they seemed more like a military formation rather than a group of teenagers walking to school. That vibe seemed to be felt by everyone as all heads turned towards them as Naruto led the group through the street and headed straight for Kuo. Ignoring the attention they were receiving, Naruto wanted to pout at Aoi's actions but decided he'd rather continue living and kept walking without a second thought. Entering Kuo, Naruto led them straight for their classes as Michael was kind enough to have them assigned to the same class, though originally filled they had managed to make some space as a few students had some living rearrangements. Locating their class, Naruto had a question run through his mind. How would Jabberwock pass off as a student, he looked nothing like a teenager. But it would be amusing to see everyone's reaction to Jabberwock simply attending this school. Though Naruto hated attending school, he was trying to convince himself that it would have been better than paperwork, though it did not seem to be working. Locating their classroom, Naruto slid open the door and entered with his subordinates following. Oh, you must be the new students. A man in his late thirties said as he greeted his new students before he nervously directed them towards their seats. Getting a single look from Jabberwock had him shaking in his shoes, being a teacher how could he not be afraid of such an intimidating student who was more of a man rather than a teenager. He had completely skipped their introductions and began class straight away, the glare he kept getting from the one called Jabberwock scared him immensely. Something told him that if he pushed their buttons he would be facing death. After class, Naruto was surrounded by his officers once more as they planned to leave the classroom and find an area to eat lunch. Though not a single member liked this situation any more than the other, they did not wish to spend time with any of the students here either. Following Naruto out once more, Naruto led them up a flight of stairs and headed for the roof. Before they could fully moving up the stairs, Naruto stopped and his eyes narrowed. Everyone else had their guard up as they sensed a single magical signature approaching them. Yada and Hekadoth both moved to intercept the whoever was approaching and Naruto waited with Aoi and Jabberwock, soon Naruto found himself face to face with a beautiful young bespectacled woman with long straight black hair that reached down to her knees with split bangs and heterochromic eyes. What are you doing here devil? Aoi asked as her tone turned serious, everyone else was following standard procedure as their first priority was to protect Naruto and capture the threat. Having accomplished both tasks, they were now moving on to interrogating captured target. Naruto-sama, 
I am Tsubaki Shinra. I am the queen of Sona Sitri, heiress to the Sitri clan. The newly named Tsubaki introduced with a bow of her head. After a returning her gaze towards Naruto who still had a cheerful expression plastered onto his face, she continued speaking, Kaichu, wishes to meet with you after school. Well tell Sona-san that we will meet with her when we are done with school. Naruto responded with a friendly wave of his hand before resuming his previous action and scaled the flight of stairs. Of course, Naruto-sama. Tsubaki said with another bow before she walked away from the group of exorcists. Naruto, you're gonna meet with that devil? Jabberwock asked. Yes, it is common courtesy to greet your host is it not? Naruto questioned. You just want to avoid doing that stack of paperwork, Behemoth-sama sent you isn't it? Aoi asked. Releasing a nervous laugh Naruto did not answer her question as he kept on scaling the flight of stairs, that proved Aoi's guess was correct. None of the other members seemed to be surprised by their commander's actions, it was pretty common. If Naruto did not blow off his work, then something was definitively wrong. Arriving at on the roof, Naruto sat down and unpacked his lunch. Looking at his precious noodles, Naruto broke off a pair of chopsticks and began digging in. Taking a single noddle into his mouth, Naruto savored its taste before he began devouring the noddles and broth like there was no tomorrow. Finishing in a matter of seconds, Naruto took the second bowl of instant ramen out and began preparing it. Naruto, we have to discuss something while we get the chance. Jabberwock said as he faced Naruto with a serious look on his face. Seeing that Naruto had motion for him to continue, Jabberwock did just that, an invitation has been sent from the underworld by Sears X Lucifer, it is an invitation to head to the underworld as a representing party from heaven. What for? A series of raiding games that devils participate in. What has Michael Sama said about this? Michael said to send you and Gabriel to act as the representatives. Hmm, send word to the entire pillar. Naruto said suddenly as he reached into his pockets and pulled out a cross, I think it's time for you make your debut among the devils, Jabberwock. The end. Now we will see you in the next video.